Okay, let me call the March 5th, 2020 meeting of the Planning Commission, City Planning Commission to order. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Maxwell? Here. Spellman? Here. Dawson? Here. Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? Here. Conway? Here. Chair Schifrin? Here. Are there any statements of disqualification? Seeing none, this is a time for oral communications. Oral communications is when anyone can speak on an item that's not on our agenda tonight, but is legitimately before the commission for, and you can talk for three minutes. <coughs> and if you'd give us your name, that would be appreciated. Come on up. Uh, good evening, my name is Barbara Benish. I live down on the west side, and I want to address the issue of the circles, um, which was uh, discussed last week. Um, there were many things that came up, and it was not possible to really respond to some of the issues that were brought up. Um, I've lived there for six years. I'm an artist and an educator, and I've written a book called Forum Art in the Environment. You can Google it. And I wanted to talk about the intangibility of the circle church and how important that is for our neighborhood. There are things that are there that we can't just put on a building. It's been there for generations, and I think there was not due process that happened when these people bought the property. And we would like a chance for you as the planners of this city to give us more time to be able to save the circles. Um, how much time do I have? A little more? Um, Tess, are you keeping time? Okay, okay, ahead. thank you. She'll let you know when you're... Okay, just, yeah. Um, so w some of the things that happen are that um, I believe there's supposed to be a public hearing and that the, develop the new owners are supposed to deal with the public and the community who have been there for generations. They talked at us. There was not really discussion or listening to the issues of the neighborhood and all the community spaces that have been there forever. And I think what happened last week when some of the young people came up and talked about how they had grown up in the Circle Church and had yoga and um, classes and dance and basketball practice, and that that won't be able to be passed on to the next generation, how unfortunate that is for all of us who live there and for our children. I raised my two teenagers there too. They rode by that church every morning going to Santa Cruz High. And I think it's a shame that that is not going to be able to be kept open to the community. If, it, if they say in their plans they're having a community space that's going to be in between, it's still privatized. That is not for the community anymore, even if it looks like it on paper. If the historical uh, review said that there's going to be historical plats, plaques remembering the church, then doesn't that mean that it had historical value and that we should be able to keep that? It's kind of an irony that we're remembering a thing we're going to let be torn down. There's so many examples of neighborhoods like the circles in the U.S. that can be renovated. We have great plans what we want to do for this neighborhood that can put it on the map and preserve it. So we ask you to please keep that into consideration. Listen to our plans we're trying to get together and give us some time to do that. Thank you. You, want to, you can go ahead and start. Hi, I'm Carolyn Ronzano, and I've lived in the Circles area for almost 21 years. I raised my daughter there. Um, and as Barbara had mentioned, um, we are learning so much fascinating history about our neighborhood as we're trying to save the Circle Church. And we had reached out to a historian, Charlie Duncan, with um, Interactive Resources. And his daughter lives here in Santa Cruz. He came down for Thanksgiving and drove around the area. And he's the one who first brought it to our attention that he thinks it qualifies as a historic district. And um, Page and Turnbull agree, the planning department agrees, and the city council, it's the first time I've ever seen them all agree on something, is also proponents of some type of historic designation for this neighborhood. I also want to talk about um, a request to have an environmental impact report done. I was checking into that to see what the justification is to request one. And I read that if there is potential um, significant cultural disruption, <clears throat> that is a cause for a environmental impact report. 
and it will be a huge disruption. This, chart, this um, church has been a part of everyone's lives. Our children, my daughter's grown, but now on my street there's two four-year-olds, a two-year-old, a young couple getting ready to start a family, and it should be there for them too. It's been there for over 130 years. And we've been accused of being emotional and sentimental, but those are all manifestations of love. <coughs> and that church is beloved by the neighborhood. Um, it's an iconic landmark for us, and it's not just the circles. Everyone in Santa Cruz has a story about the circle church. Everyone's had some type of experience there. It means something to the community, and it's so unique, and it's so special. And this project is not site development or specific to that site. They could find another one and a half, two acre parcel and do their same project. It doesn't have to be there. And as a community, we recognize that we would have to purchase it back. And we're starting efforts to look at, to start fundraising. But we need time. We want to save it. It's important to us. And we just ask that you keep that in mind as you're evaluating this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Freya Sands, and I also live in the circles. And I'm just here to present to you um, a document. I just have two copies to circulate around. Garfield Park Circles Neighborhood Context. Um, and we hope that it will give you some background to understand the dr what drives our efforts for its continued service in our neighborhood. We seek to preserve the property for future service that its legacy deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else for oral communications? Um, I wonder if I could ask the planning director if you could describe what the process is for the Circles Church. It's been to the Star Preservation Commission. It's been back to the council. Will it be coming to the commission? What uh, what can we tell the neighbors about what that process is? Since there seems to be some. Sure, the project will be coming back to, or coming to the planning commission uh, in the coming months, and then it will be back in front of the council. The, the council hasn't considered the project itself. The council has considered the historic designation of the site. They unanimously uh, <coughs> recommended that it not be listed, as did the historic preservation commission unanimously recommended that it not be listed. And so, uh, given that, uh, had it been listed, then to proceed um, with the demolition of the structure, it would have triggered an EIR, uh, and that environmental impact report would have had a longer timeline. So the applicants now um, that the CEQA path is determined by it not being historic, they're moving forward. I would expect within a month or two that the uh, project is before the Planning Commission. You'll be in a recommendation capacity. It'll go to the City Council for approval. Will the project include the demolition or is the demolition on a separate path? The project includes the demolition. So I hope that's understood. The project with it, the environmental review recommendation is going to come back to the <coughs> Planning Commission sometime in the future. That will be a public hearing. Uh, you all can attend, present your testimony. There'll be a staff report and recommendation that will come out in advance that you can review and respond to. The commission then will make a recommendation to the city council. The commission is not the final decision maker on this project. Uh, the commission will make a recommendation. It will then go to a public hearing at the city council. They'll make a final decision on it. Okay? Thank you very much. All right. No more uh, oral communications. Do we have any announcements? Do we have any presentations? So, well, I no, not it's a regular agenda item. So, no. So we come to the um, minutes. Um, are there any concerns about the minutes, or would somebody like to make a motion to approve the minutes? <coughs> make a motion to approve the minutes of February twentieth, two thousand and twenty. Is there a second? All second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. We now come to item number two under general business, building electrification through prohibition of use of natural gas in new construction. Could we have a staff report, please? And welcome, Tiffany. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm Tiffany Wiseless, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager 
and this is my colleague, Kurt Hurley, the Green Building Specialist. And we're here today to share with you um, the uh, building electrification policy and background that the City Council has directed us to pursue. Um, I should note that this is a courtesy referral. It is not required that building electrification come in front of uh, the Planning Commission. However, we're happy to take individual comments that you might have and pass those along to the commission uh, to council or if you choose to make a recommendation as a body we can also do so so um, you are not required to do so however the latter okay um, so starting things off we have three objectives for this evening uh, number one we would like to let you know how did this come about in the city and why are we taking a look at building electrification we'd like to share with you um, what City Council directed us to do what approach and what uh, the timeline is and where we're at in that process and then we'd love to hear any feedback you might have and answer any questions you might have and again pass along that feedback to City Council to start things off you know, there are several drivers as to why we uh, are looking at building electrification. First of all, in 2018, the city did declare a climate change emergency, really attempting to accelerate our efforts in reducing emissions. Secondly, uh, we did uh, in 2019, the council adopted a resolution supporting the Green New Deal. And this also calls for accelerated action, specifically pointing to the fact um, that uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that they, we really only have 10 years before we reach a tipping point. And so while this is something that perhaps uh, the energy code, the state energy code might take up in its next code cycle or the following code cycle, that's three to six years away. And that's a good chunk of that 10 year time period. Thus accelerating our efforts makes a lot of sense. And then finally, when I was here in front of you, uh, I don't know when that was a couple weeks back, I talked to you about the health and all policies initiative, which really, um, as you'll see in this presentation, building electrification really touches upon public health, equity, and sustainability, the three pillars of health and all policies. And so we really view this as an operationalization of those new policies that we have in place uh, with health and all policies. So uh, City Council in the fall of last year directed staff to bring back options um, for building electrification. Um, Kurt and I have participated in the California Zero Energy Building Task Force since January of last year. So we were very clued into what the options are that other jurisdictions were considering. And Council had a second piece to that, that they really wanted us to align the timeline on the rollout of building electrification with Monterey Bay Community powers roll out of some support incentives, um, which we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Also, Monterey Bay Community Powers Electrification Strategic Plan that was recently adopted explicitly calls for transportation and built environment or building electrification as the two key uh, emissions reduction strategies for our region and provide for these incentives that I've already mentioned. And then last, um, you know, the state has a carbon neutrality goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2045, and building electrification is one of the ways that we can contribute to the state achieving that target. Also, so why electrification? What, what is the deal with this that makes this such a potentially transformative emissions reduction um, mechanism? By switching um, our fuels from natural gas to electricity, we are essentially then using energy that is carbon free. And be that is because Monterey Bay Community Power sources all of our electricity procurement in this region for 97% of accounts in this region from hydropower and renewable energy thus making it carbon free. So the more we can get away from natural gas, we can drastically reduce emissions. And as you can see uh, in the lower left hand uh, pie chart, just looking at the built environment and vehicles, vehicles of course in our region represent the majority of emissions uh, in our region. And we do have a number of um, strategies in place to address uh, vehicle emissions. 
However, what we're really trying to get at with this policy is that 18% that you see in the blue wedge. And if you look over to the right pie chart, you can see how that's built out in terms of, um, or how that's broken out rather, in terms of built environment emissions. So here we're really talking about space conditioning, so heating and cooling, water heating, and uh, in this chart, uh, restaurant cooking, uh, both residential and commercial cooking, which as you'll see later on um, is something that it is such a minor amount and we've uh, seen from experience that um, exempting cooking uh, in those kinds of establishments really makes a lot of sense for us. Another reason that we're taking a look at this is that natural gas, methane, um, really has a lot of points of leakage from the extraction point to the utilization and combustion of it within a home. You can see on the right-hand side the map of the United States and a number of our natural gas uh, deposits and repositories and their corresponding leakage rates. That's leakage, that's methane that's going uncombusted and going straight into the atmosphere and methane is very much more potent than carbon dioxide. So this is something to be concerned about. If you look at the left-hand chart, which is the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions inventory, if you look on the far right bar uh, in that graph, that 24% additional increase is attributable to that leakage that's across the entire supply chain for natural gas. And we've also seen that that has resulted in catastrophic uh, explosions and uh, in San Bruno and other places throughout the country. In fact, as recently as a couple weeks ago in Massachusetts, a series of these types of explosions. Moreover, we know that this is something that is not commonly known is that the combustion of natural gas within the home results in all of these uh, toxic chemicals being emitted and Air pollution levels are not regulated in indoor uh, environments. They are in outdoor environments, but 55 to 70 percent of homes with gas stoves would not meet outdoor air quality standards. And there are a number of studies, including from the California Air Resources Board, that supports uh, this statement. And so there are true concerns around indoor air quality and public health and health in the home. With that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Kurt, who's going to talk about how uh, building electrification will also reduce our economy-wide energy consumption. Thank you, Tiffany, and good evening, commissioners. I'd like in this slide to quickly review the, the overall effect of electrification of the built environment. On the left side of the equation, we look at a fuel switching impact of increase of electric consumption in the built environment. And the second portion of that sum is the adoption of more efficient and emerging and proven electric appliance technologies. So we see on the left that we're actually increasing our electric consumption uh, 30 to 35 percent, but the result on the right side is actually a reduction in overall energy intensity for the built environment. Now, at first glance, this might seem to defy logic. However, the fuel switching allows us to use energy in a way that's radically different than in the past. Gas fuel appliances created new sources of heat in the appliance design to either heat water or to heat air for an interior environment. Heat pump technology, which is the new electric approach, is capable of moving existing heat energy from the exterior to the interior or the reverse at will. And so when we combine that, that radical paradigm shift in how we are satisfying the comfort of our buildings, we res the result, the end result, is an overall reduction in the energy intensity <coughs> of our built environment. So I'd like to briefly go over the, the different uh, windows, if you will, on the, the cost effectiveness of electrification. There's four of those. I'm going to briefly talk about initially the site impact. So the entire project cost, the cost of the structure plus the infrastructure cost to supply fuel to it. 
the published pg and e value for a single family to provide gas service with a meter in exceeds fifteen thousand dollars so in the case of newly built low-rise residential uh, we, we look at a, a net savings that can actually s exceed the numbers that are quoted here. This, there's, there are marginal increases in some of the electric appliance approaches. It's going to depend on each individual design. Um, there are two major peer-reviewed cost-effectiveness studies that validate these results, one by the Energy Commission's primary investigator for their TDV methodology, E3, and also the Energy Commission's own study with Frontier Energy. And both of them come up with comparable numbers in excess to what we're looking at here. One of the things, I'm going to look at the second one now. One of the things that is, is frustrating for building owners and renters and businesses that are entering into a lease is it's really a black box is in terms of what will the projected cost be to operationally occupy the building, meaning the utilities. And that's part of the cost effectiveness studies that have been done for all electric approach. And it, it ties in well with the fourth window, so I'll just kind of uh, cue you up on that. Uh, I'd like to also add that with our 2019 <coughs> energy code for low-rise residential, we, are, we now have a general solar requirement. And the, the net present value of solar, for every dollar, we're approximately going to get $2 back over the life of that array, even including every 11 years, changing out the inverter, et cetera. So the, the addition of solar adds to the overall uh, cost competitiveness of an all-electric approach. And finally, as I mentioned uh, in the second window, we have uh, the consideration of what has occurred in the past, in the past decade, in the increase in the rate of <clears throat> electricity versus natural gas and what is projected to occur over the next decade. So going back uh, in the past decade, there was greater than a 20% excess in the increase for the price of natural gas compared to electricity. And that projection is approximately identical for the coming decade. So what, what that means is $1,000 we're spending today for fuel, if it's natural gas, is going to become almost $1,500. In the case of electricity, uh, $1,300. So the erosion of um, disposable income or operational costs for a business are impacted by staying with uh, with the gas as a fuel choice. So I'll move on here. I know I spent a little more time than I promised. Um, so we we want to consider now what are some of the and we, we covered this earlier, but what are the, what are the breaks downs in in our um, distribution of of uh, equipment? So uh, here we've we've added those appliances which are able to substitute or stand in for legacy appliances. And starting on the lower right, our space conditioning, we have very efficient uh, ductless approaches that can both cool and heat buildings that are very cost effective. Uh, they're also great for retrofitting the existing built environment. Going counterclockwise, or sorry, clockwise to the, to the left, uh, we have an example of a heat pump water heater. Uh, its form factor is very small, so there's a minimal impact to mechanical rooms because the condensing unit is integrated to the appliance. Uh, moving up at 9 o'clock, we have our appliances for cooking. There's actually six approaches that don't involve induction, uh, so there are many, many choices to, to achieve uh, our preparation of food with an all-electric. Coming up to 10 o'clock, we have clothes drying. This is typically achieved with either condensing or condensing heat pump, which is more efficient miscellaneous uses. We just reviewed uh, all of the electric fireplace uh, offerings, uh, and we were sharing that in, during the study session up on the up at 2 o'clock. So just wanted to give a brief overview of the electric appliance options that are available. Now I'd like to spend a moment reviewing the types of policy, and we have nearly 30 jurisdictions in California that have some type of electrification policy in place. So we're, we're going to begin here in this list with our natural gas uh, infrastructure moratorium. Uh, there, there are actually, I think we've missed a couple here, but there are seven uh, communities that have done that. Uh, in the middle, we have an all-electric reach code. So an all-electric reach code achieves an, a similar result, but it's done through 
an amendment to the California Energy Code, whereas a natural gas infrastructure moratorium is typically in another part of a, of a city's uh, municipal ordinances, generally the, uh, the, the health and safety. Moving down to the bottom, electric preferred, which is the third type of policy option, which has been uh, popular, preserves the choice of fuel for new structures, but requires a higher energy performance or lower fuel consumption if the design continues to use natural gas. So our council has reviewed some of the uh, considerations relevant to those options and has directed us to prepare a natural gas prohibition. So I'd like to walk you through in this flowchart from left to right how that would work for a new construction permit application. So beginning <clears throat> on the square on the left, we would move through the right arrow into the dialogue box that's vertically extended, and the determination would be made if, if the application constituted one of the exemptions. And those exemptions are restaurants, new facilities utilizing industrial process heat, additional dwelling units, less than or equal to 750 square feet, and a design that uh, would, would be uh, contrary to public interest to pursue uh, the all-electric approach or infeasible. So now moving again <coughs> to the right, if it is determined it is an exemption in the design or the uh, application, there is an allowance to either do a co-compliant mixed fuel design and, and some of the others, there's an allowance just for that special use, say the equipment for creating the process heat or, um, or in the case of a restaurant for the cooking. If the answer is no, that, that the application does not constitute any of the exemptions, the structure, the design would be code compliant, all electric. So no additional efficiency margin. It would just be built to the 2019 energy standards as an all electric design. And then there's some nuances here just with the existing code. Starting at the, at the lower right at the bottom, for a non-residential new structure, PV is not required by the 2019 Energy Code, so it would be an all-electric co-compliant without PV. And then there's a bifurcation up on the top. If it's greater than three stories, there is no PV required, and it would be an all-electric, and then less than or equal to, uh, there is a general requirement for solar in the Energy Code with some exemptions uh, due to uh, solar access and some others. So that's a, that's a quick overview of the prohibition. And I just want to kind of review the uh, definition here. Mixed fuel, and I think I did mention this, is again an approach which would continue to use a mixture of electricity for plug loads and natural gas for water heating and space conditioning and other uh, heat requiring applications in the structure. So the ordinance, uh, we're, we are actually working on it. We, we, we had some changes just in the last, uh, very recently, and um, we're, we're working on integrating uh, the, all those comments together, and uh, actually tomorrow I'm, I'm probably gonna be having that. Uh, but we just wanted to let you know that it, this is a, it's a, it's a, it is a working draft currently as we speak today. Um, here I'd like to provide an overview of the emissions impact. So we, we looked back in the last three years of our city's <coughs> development pipeline, and we looked at the different categories, uh, single family, uh, multifamily dwellings, uh, and we, we came up with an, uh, uh, the best uh, projection of our development over the next 60 months or five years. So what we're looking at is in January of 2025, as, as 600 dwelling units are built, this would be the avoided emissions with the prohibition. So we have slightly over 300 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year with the, all the structures being built to the 2019 code as mixed fuel. And then with option A, as Tiffany had mentioned earlier, with the carbon-free procurement of Monterey Bay Clean Power, those emissions are eliminated. Now, just want to quickly note, in our, in our nation, the average turn of building stock on an annual basis is approximately 1%. The climatic conditions of our city allows particularly wood frame construction to last longer. So 
the aggregate impacts on a, on a greater portion of our built environment will take uh, considerable time to be reduced with this uh, with this prohibition. So we look we look forward to other measures which can uh, stimulate the uh, retrofit of existing buildings. The updates to our city's green building program <coughs> really give designers a lot of information and um, guidance in terms of optimizing all electric designs. <coughs> Okay, just want to, we're rounding the corner here to finish up. I wanted to share with you what we've been doing today. We've been conducting extensive outreach with the community. Uh, we've conducted two community workshops. Um, we also had our extensive city council study session where we did have some good um, public participation. Um, we did conduct two developers roundtables, one in the fall and one just recently. Um, and Kurt and I have been meeting on Tuesday mornings from 8.30 to 9.30 um, with trade, the trades folks, vendors, designers, and builders to talk about whatever aspect they'd like to talk about with respect to electrification, and that will wind up uh, next Tuesday. Of course, today um, we also consider this uh, a public uh, event as well, uh, although we don't have too many people in the crowd. In terms of the policy process, again, uh, it is not required we come to Planning Commission, but of course, because um, future development under a natural gas prohibition could indeed come in front of Planning Commission, we wanted to come in front of you and get your feedback. We are scheduled with City Council for a first ordinance hearing on March 24th, uh, with the second hearing following a couple weeks later. And we are intending, um, we're planning a building electrification expo at Earth Day where vendors will be able to bring appliances and equipment. Um, green builders will be able to come and showcase their all electric buildings to get our uh, residents familiar with these kinds of um, uh, appliances and equipment and so forth. And I've also just firmed up in the summer at the farmer's market, it's very likely we are going to have a celebrity chef induction cooked up cook off. So that's a creative thing that we're also trying to do. And our implementation date is scheduled for July 1st, uh, barring any changes. We have many resources, including the slide decks for all of the outreach, um, some frequently asked questions, some fact sheets um, that are at cityofsantacruz.com slash policy. We do have a resource guide on uh, equipment vendors that's in development that will be coming out very soon as well. And with that, um, we'd love to answer any questions that you might have or take any feedback that you might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You're um, welcome. We can start with questions from the commission and then see if there's any public input and then we can see if there's any commission actions that anybody would like to take. So you had your hand up. You. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, even though the list is growing, I think of cities that have adopted ordinances in a similar fashion, it seems like we're still an early adopter if you look at the big picture. So I'm, I'm uh, impressed that we're taking those steps and, and making those things happen. Feels like we're being proactive as opposed to reactive again. Um, so I had two questions. One is, what what is the significance of going with the I forget the language, but the ordinance change versus a full like code reach and getting uh, energy commission approval for that. Um, if you could elaborate on that, if you know. Sure. And the second question would be, I'm curious on exemption for ADUs or small ADUs, I guess less than 750. Yes, I think I'll take the first question and Kurt can take the second question. So with the natural gas prohibition approach, we are looking at a modification of our municipal codes health and safety chapter. If we went for the REACH code, there are three uh, things that need to happen. There needs to be a cost effectiveness study done, which the state has actually done for various options already. So that would not be a cost barrier for us. Um, secondly, uh, because this is uh, title, tw that would be in Title 24, we would come to planning, we would need to come to planning commission. And number three, we would need to take uh, that language to the California Energy Commission for approval. So those are the three things that would need to happen if we took the full reach code approach. As we demonstrated, however, 
this approach gets us the biggest emissions reduction. So I think council saw that and wanted to take um, the the approach that had the bigger impact. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I might think I was leaning more towards enforceability as one stronger than the other. I think that would be the question. I'm, I'm going to let my colleague who uh, who deals more with that to answer that question as well as your exemption question. And so I just, I'd add a couple other considerations on the prohibition. So because it is a municipal ordinance, uh, the city can consider it as an infraction for a violation, which that clause exists. Also, um, just retracting on the uh, considerations before council, we also did some analysis which would have the least potential impact on the various segments of operations within the building planning division. So we looked at current planning, field inspection, and building plan check. And the prohibition had a slightly lower, in our initial analysis, impact on our operations. So now I'd like to move on to the question regarding the exemption. Why ADUs at 750 square feet? So I want to talk in three regions. First, technical. So in the case of the cost effectiveness studies, both for the base code and for the REACH code, the California Energy Commission has two prototype structures, one a single story 2,100 square feet and a second a two story 2,700 square feet, the average being about 2,400. So essentially, there's a 30 year analysis for low rise residential. We look at the costs, the incremental costs of efficiency measures or measures that are solely uh, required for electrification and we compare the cost for installation and the cost for maintenance with the on-bill savings over that 30-year period. We make assumptions about inflation and the discount rate. And those features, everything that the commission has done in the last six code cycles has to show cost effectiveness based on this criteria. What starts to fall apart with the ADU is some of those incremental costs are uh, they're quantized, so they, they're not going to reduce in scale with reduced square footage, which is, say, a, say approximately a quarter of all of the prototype structures around which the cost-effectiveness studies are determined. Now, there's another piece in cost-effectiveness before I go on to the second and third major category, and that is that for all newly constructed <coughs> types of structures, an ADU is the one for which we're certain there's already a structure on the parcel and likely there's already a meter and gas service to it. So the number, the 15, say $16,000 that's saved, typically when you're doing new construction, it's the first improvement on the parcel is reduced. So it's just the trenching to extend that gas service from the primary structure to the ADU, which could be more in the order of six to $8,000 approximately. So in the, in the general considerations for cost effectiveness of electrification, we're sort of missing two of those and, 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 and there's not exactly a fit. And so now I'm gonna move on from cost to policy. So we, we have <coughs> um, updates to our own city's um, requirements and restrictions on additional dwelling units. The, impact fees begin at 750 square feet uh, for schools. Um, so there's, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a good consistency between the choice of that number and the, the other impacts that occur as the scope of the ADU permit applications square footage increases. And lastly, <coughs> I'd like to move on to the technical considerations surrounding that. There's two technical considerations. The first of those is I have frequent dialogues with energy analysts who prepare the compliance documents for the permit applications that I review, as well as my colleagues. And they're just uh, you know, putting projects through the compliance software for the 2019 Energy Code. And there was a 700 square foot ADU, and it was challenging for it to comply without either a, a, a more restrictive requirement that requires more inspections for insulation, it's called QII, or putting a special type of heat recovering ventilation system, which add costs. So I was acknowledging the fact that the ADUs, as in the past code cycle, you know, they're, 
they're rather challenged to comply. And so adding any upfront costs, particularly that um, those applicants, there's some often cost sensitivity was a consideration. Um, and then the, the second um, um, technical consideration on the ADUs is, um, it's escaping my mind at this moment, but I'll, I'll, it will come back to me and maybe I'll jump in for something and maybe this will uh, help trigger your mind or uh, maybe it was what you were <laughs> okay. speaking about. But I, I just wanted to point out that the um, the gas prohibition uh, or the, excuse me, the gas allowance for ADUs uh, at or below 750 square feet would um, allow for water heating and space heating. Um, it would not, it, the, the gas prohibition would still extend to the cooking. And um, you saw the slide that Tiffany spoke to about the indoor air quality implications of uh, the gas ranges. And with that um, smaller unit, we were particularly concerned about indoor air quality uh, associated with cooking. And therefore we continued to extend the natural gas prohibition to the cooking appliances, but did allow it for the larger energy uses, uh, the water heating and air conditioning, because it was more challenging to meet the 2019 building codes and the energy code in particular with the all electric appliances. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, as a follow-up to that, I could see an incentive. I mean, I, I would like to keep incentives for ADUs, especially smaller ADUs, because I think those are the the market we're, we're looking to um, build up in this community. Um, it seemed to make sense to me, though, the real cost really is to the community, right? If we're allowing these people to get away with dirtier uh, energy, essentially, um, maybe you could still require it, but if there is gas on property, then they would have that exemption, right? But they don't necessarily, they would have to ask for it, right? The, the, the idea would be to encourage the all electric and if you had gas already on site and it made sense, then you could ask for that exemption as opposed to just giving it altogether. Just an idea. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Let me follow up with that because I had a, a similar concern. <coughs> I guess I, I wasn't clear you know, in, your, in your response to the question whether there was really a distinction between an ADU that was built adjacent to an existing unit and an ADU that was being built at the same time as a new unit because I think we've been seeing uh, applications, especially now when it's so easy to get an ADU, for uh, new single family dwellings to come in with an, uh, an ADU as part of it. And <laughs> I just wonder if that same analysis, I, I guess got a little lost whether since with a new development, if, uh, a new single family dwelling unit, there would be the requirement for uh, all electric uh, facilities, then it didn't seem make, to make a lot of sense to me that the ADU wouldn't have to meet that same requirement. Thank you for the question, Chairperson Schifrin. The, so I wanna answer this in two parts. So when an ADU is contiguous or attached to an existing structure, either a conversion, say, of an attached garage or, and or an addition, the, that is considered an addition in the energy code. The scope of the prohibition is for newly constructed buildings. And in the case of the ADU, the requirement for all electric for an ADU that exceeds 750 square feet has to meet the <coughs> definition of a standalone structure through the definitions of an ADU that is in our zoning ordinance. So it's not affecting the, there's, uh, you know, the junior additional dwelling unit, but if it's over 500 square feet, it would be of something else, an attached additional dwelling unit. But the scope of the prohibition is only for an entirely new separate foundation detached structure that exceeds the 750 square feet. Is that, is that now, um, is that clarified? Uh, to be honest, it's as clear as mud. But because I thought if somebody's building a 2,000 square foot house and at the same time they want to have a 700 square foot uh, ADU that's detached in their backyard, but have a separate entrance, but it's being built at the same time. 
what I hear, well, as I read the ordinance, what it's saying is, well, the house, the 2,000 square foot house would have to be all electric, but the ADU, which is being built at the same time and on the same piece of property, could have gas, space heating, and water heating. And I, 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 first I want to be sure that that's what you were saying, and then I, it didn't quite make sense to me and unfortunately, your explanation didn't help. So maybe you could do, could try again. I'm sorry. I could. <clears throat> you could help me, Peter? Yeah, I think I, the answer to your question is yes, that could happen if, if, mm -hmm. as the ordinance reads today, right? As the ordinance reads today, you are. I mean, correct. I don't think it would be financially feasible or, or cost effective to do that, but you could do it. Um, this is, I think, the way it would go. So, so, but I guess my question is, why would we allow that to happen? I mean, is that good public policy? I mean, wouldn't it be better to say for an ADU of a detached ADU of whatever side of size, if it's being built at the same time as a new, if it's a new ADU with a new single-family dwelling unit, it's, it had the code would apply to it as well. I. I, I I understand that you're just taking comments to, today, so I mean, I'm just, I just, that was just one of the questions I had uh, because it seemed somewhat contradictory. Okay, other commission, commissioner questions? I have, I have a couple questions. Go ahead. I have some more too, but you go first. Um, in the uh, in the staff report, it um, mentioned that that what we're being or what what city council had um, approved to move forward was option B. Um, I'm curious what option A was. I mean, is was that the um, was that the the reach code piece? So I'll I'll take that, Commissioner Nielsen. The option A was the prohibition, which we presented to you. Option B was a electric preferred reach code, which would have required a higher energy performance, lower annual energy use, had the mixed fuel approach, i.e. still using natural gas, um, been submitted at the time for the design. Okay, and that's what that's, there was that slide that you guys presented just tonight that had those two options that were, that had, that were highlighted. Maybe I think, and must no. have misunderstood that. No, there was only one option presented. However, at council, we did uh, present both options. There it is. So on the left is the actual code that's in place right now and the emissions associated with the 600 dwelling units. Mm -hmm. Option A, which is the natural gas prohibition, would have no emissions associated with that, with those 600 units, because the natural gas would be prohibited. One other piece to option B um, that Kurt didn't mention is in addition to the mixed fuel with the higher efficiency, we also brought forward um, required solar PV or payment of a carbon in lieu of fee for the different types of buildings that currently solar PV is not required for. So that's anything other than um, less than and equal to three stories residential, which is required by the current code. Mm -hmm. Could you just say what PD is, please? PV, uh, solar PV, solar pho photovoltaics. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of the reach code, I, I um, also I, I had another question about that too. I think on the on the flow chart slide, it mentioned reach code in there. So is that, um, so it being exempt, an exemption to the reach code, is that, is that what, is that what, because I, the way I understood that, it was that, that we weren't be, doing reach code. That, I'm sorry, that should actually be as an exception to the prohibition. Okay. That's a carryover mistake. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for allowing us to clarify that. Um, okay, so then the other, the other question I have is, um, just in, from a bigger picture, is the, um, what's the, aside from building electrification, is there a strategy um, to reduce greenhouse gases to get to levels of that, that the state has put in place? I mean, beyond this, I mean, that you guys are looking at for the city itself? Are you talking specifically for the built environment or are you talking broadly about transportation? I think, I, well, transportation? I guess I, I think I'm talking broadly and I, th and I think part of it is that 
Well, I guess we can, starting with the built environment, the, um, just curi curious what the, what I expect is that when, when building electrification happens, and I know it's a long process, but as that happens, I, it, already we, you, you're presenting the gas prices are increasing, and, and I w would assume that with the infrastructure being there for gas, as there are less customers that happen, the gas prices will continue to go up because they have to pay for that infrastructure. Um, so I'm wondering if, is, has there been a measured approach that has been considered to take that into account um, because there's going to be residents that are affected by that, by going to full electrification? Sure. Uh, so to answer that question, I think I'll point to a couple things. First of all, um, through Monterey Bay Community Power, we have the ability to advocate for uh, rates that can help those with lower means. So that's something that we have primed our representatives to Monterey Bay Community Power to be looking at. Um, secondly, I, I, this doesn't really answer your question, but pg and &E acknowledges that their legacy natural gas infrastructure is problematic and in fact are writing us a letter of support for our natural gas prohibition and had indeed uh, got up in Berkeley's city council to also say that they supported this. Um, that doesn't really get to your question exactly, but it kind of shows what the trend is. I don't know if, Kurt, do you have anything else to add to that in terms of the natural gas rates? Sure, so Commissioner Nielsen, coming back to the beginning of your question, if we look at the broad policy landscape, um, the United Nations is beginning this year regulating the fuel efficiency of new aircraft design. Our state regulates the fuel efficiency of vehicles and sets a roadmap for the adoption of electric vehicles. But it's at cities and counties, it's, it's this level of government that we can um, you know, set a path for leadership and acknowledging some of the challenges we have societally and ask more of, of buildings and in this case um, switching to a fuel that has a lower environmental impact and is uh, is more promising in terms of the operational cost of the structure going forward as it is foreseeable to us based on past data and the best indicators of how that will move in in the coming decade so if we bring all that back it's it's the most reasonable to <clears throat> create an all-electric structure from the beginning of the design process. It's far more difficult to take our <laughs> existing built environment and retrofit, but there are both incentives and emerging uh, appliances and uh, facilitating accessories that will help us do that. So it's a combination of working with the new built environment, which the prohibition addresses, and then looking at partnership with our utility incentives, the green building program to work with our existing built environment as those um, those structures are modified or uh, added to. Does that, does that? Yeah, it's, it, yeah, you guys are, are, you're answering the question, I think, in from the kind of the built environment piece. And I guess part of the additional question I have to that is, uh, is are there discussions within the city around um, prohibitions on other, um, other gas, you know, like vehicles, for example. I mean, is that is that something that's also in the works of being discussed? So um, we can go to our slide on transportation, but there are a number of things that are happening with respect to transportation. Uh, transportation. Um, we are trying to get in place a fleet electrification plan. We have um, the VW settlement agreement that we were successful in becoming one of the cities that is getting investment in the form of uh, DC fast chargers that are gonna come online this year. We have um, the downtown uh, Go, Go Santa Cruz transportation demand management program that was recently launched with free bus passes. We have the jump bikes. So there are a number of things happening on the transportation front. I think it's important to say here though, we as a city have a lot more leverage in terms of the built environment because transportation comes down to behavior change and choices, which is really difficult to get at. I mean, Public Works is doing a good job at that, um, but this really gets us that 18% with one 
policy mechanism. And I also want to mention one other thing on the incentives. So Monterey Bay Community Power is going to be rolling out, getting to the affordability uh, aspect. They're going to be rolling out incentives for multifamily affordable housing for all electric, as well as for retrofits. And so that's going to, I think, really help our region with the transition as well. And they are also, they have a lot going on with respect to transportation as well in terms of incentives for electric vehicles, for EV charging stations and so forth. So we're really working closely with them in concert for them to implement their electrification strategic plan that was just recently adopted for which they have a lot of program dollars. And again, it's really important that our city representatives are active in influencing how those dollars come out so that they really reflect the needs of the community, particularly around the transportation piece. I would just add also that uh, later this year, when we're talking about broad initiatives, uh, we'll be kicking off uh, an update to our climate adaptation and action plan. And that'll be looking at our long-term strategies to meet our uh, carbon reduction goals and greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. And so that's something that Tiffany will be leading in the, the near future. Yeah, that's a major project that's kicking off July 1st, and we'll be doing a state-of-the-art climate action plan where we will be revisiting all of our goals, tiering them to the state goals, tiering them to Monterey Bay Community Power's electrification strategic plan, and really also providing for us both short-term mechanisms that we can do while we're developing the plan, as well as our longer-term mechanisms. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the Very question. Good. Good question. Um, first, thanks you guys so much. This is a really uh, amazing that you're doing all of this and I think is going to have a really big impact. And I'm wondering about, and you've answered some of my questions about the retrofit piece. Um, so I know this is focused on new construction, but for the retrofit, in addition to the multifamily, larger scale mm -hmm. affordable housing, for other households who might want to replace their appliances, um, are there programs mm -hmm. that you're thinking about and how that might rolled out yeah mm -hmm. that is the monterey bay community power retrofit is for just for single okay. yep yep exactly and for recycling the old appliances and so forth um i'm not sure it has a provision for that but i can look yeah. into that okay and and then um i guess perhaps subsidies for acquiring the the new appliances for yes families that, of limited means yeah well that's that is something that we are going to need to advocate for that is not necessarily how we haven't seen the exact structure of the um retrofit rebate program yet so there could be some consideration of that but again that's something that we really need to be actively involved in from our policy and operations board representatives Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Yes, Cindy. I just wanted um, some clarification on, so so the Monterey Community Power Retrofit Program, so is that accessing like state greenhouse gas reduction fund? Like who, no. is that funding coming from them or how does that work? It comes from them. So how that works is that Monterey Bay Community Power's rates are set at PG&E's rates with a 5% discount. Mm -hmm. So because it's not an investor-owned utility, the actual cost of the generation, there's a differential, that profit differential. Those are the program funds. Okay. I mean, taking out you know operational costs for the, the organization, those are the program funds. So they are in the order, they uh, started this year at something around 2.5 to 3 million. We're expecting them to exceed you know, $40 million very in, in the near term. So we're talking a lot of money here. And um, our boards are the ones that direct where that money goes. And so again, that's why it's really important for us to be involved in that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. May you add something to that? Because I heard today um, from the county's representative on the board that it's no longer going to be called Monterey Bay Community Power. Correct. Uh, it's been expanded into Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo. And so it's going to be Central Coast Community Power with I think a 23-member board. So um, the benefit of having a larger area involved, the, the disadvantage of our city's voice or our county's voice becomes a little bit smaller in terms of the decisions that, that get made. Other questions? I had some questions on the ordinance itself, if I could. Just since we're not acting on the ordinance, but it's going to be going to the council, <coughs> I thought I'd ask these questions. Under uh, 6.100.040B, um, 
which says to the excuse me chair do you mind if we open the ordinance up so that we can follow along with you are you okay more with than that? happy okay thank you i have it opened up on my laptop yeah let us open it real quick so we can follow along please thank you I apologize, this is probably not clean, but I think that's okay for our talking purposes. Okay. So Zero this four. is section uh, 6.100.040B, which says yes. it's for under the prohibition section, prohibited natural gas infrastructure, newly constructed buildings. Um, it talks about to the extent that natural gas infra infrastructure is pre permitted, it shall be permitted to extend to any system device or appliance <coughs> within a building for which an equivalent all electric system or design is not available. And I just wondered who made that determination of whether there's an equivalent, <coughs> um, an, an equivalent system or not. So thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. So in the appeal section, we map out uh, if there is an exemption determined, um, what would be the process for that determination? Now, if it's land use, and the examples of land use would be a restaurant with a kitchen or the additional dwelling un unit um, in excess of 750 square feet, that would be a determination based on the use of the land, the, the improvement on the parcel and its use. So that would be a, our zoning administrator. Um, and now I'm coming to your question, which has more to do with the appliances. So for those exemptions which have a technical basis, say for instance, the That's what I thought industrial process heat. Was about. Right, so the, so the industrial process heat, which would typically be temperatures in, uh, in excess of 350 Fahrenheit, there would be uh, you know, the applicant would uh, would provide the manufacturer's um, cut sheets for the that equipment that would be used for the um, for the occupancy for that structure, and that's how, that would be the basis. Say the you know the electric approach would be is either not available or we, we would just be you know they're, they're, they couldn't perform their operation. I guess what it comes down to is who decides? Is it the building official who decides where there's a, a and I think it would be helpful to let people know who's, who makes that decision. I understand the process, but somebody's gonna have to be there to say no, there isn't anything that, you know, what we got from the applicant is the best that there is. So um, I just think someone in the process needs to, this, someone, it, it's helpful in the or, if the ordinance is specific about who makes the determination. Okay. So it, is, it is the building official and it's one of the areas you'll, you'll see on the screen here, um, the area under the appeals. Oh, um, the we've appeal actually, section. yeah, we've actually made some updates from the version that you have. So what's on the screen here doesn't match your version. Um, we have this is indeed a working draft. Okay. Well, <laughs> we were uh, making changes as as or as recent as today. So so that is a, a good point and one that we want to address. Um, and so here you can actually see some of the changes well, that we've if been you're making. It's covered. I'm happy. Yeah, it, it's yeah. It's one of the things that we're trying sure to clean up to, to also make sure it's clear. And the same section or you know, uh, D, where it says the requirements of this section shall be deemed. Uh, objective planning standards under government code, such and such, and objective development standards under. I just wonder, is that, are those code sections, I didn't look them up, but is that SB 330, is that where, when they talk about objective standards, is that what we're, where that came from? Where it is, what, what, the, what I haven't looked them up yet either. I'm, I, w I assumed that was the case when I read it the first time. Because I think this is the first example that we've seen where we're putting in our code a reference to having objective standards, since that's going to be an important process that we're going to be following. During this time frame for the next uh, nearly five years, we are not able to actually introduce any subjective standards. 
So um, only objective standards can be placed, and I want to clarify, for residential development. And so this um, would apply to both commercial and residential. So from the, the residential uh, portion, um, they, they have to be objective standards. Right. Okay. So then the next one I had is the public interest exemption which is 6.100.050. And the language seemed very broad to me, and I just wondered what the, when might the, under what conditions would the public interest exemption be used? This would be used in instances, say, for example, at our um, water treatment plant, where maybe they need a, uh, a generator that is uh, a, uh, operating, a, 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 that is operational, during power outages that is going to be an alternative fuel source um, because that uh, critical infrastructure can't go down. So it's it's that less would be, likely in a residential project and yes. more likely in public Yeah, I, I would see it more as a public project exemption is how we envisioned it. And then under uh, 6.100.055 revocable building and infrastructure exemptions, when it talks about the kitchen design of restaurants, as I read the language, it seemed to say if a restaurant was built and it had uh, a gas kitchen and the restaurant was sold and somebody else bought that restaurant, they couldn't change the location of the, they couldn't rearrange the, the, uh, the appliances and still be consistent with, uh, um, with the code. And let me see where, it, where I got that from. So, it wasn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. So we removed the, that specificity oh, and okay. <laughs> if you, if you look up at a, it's, it's, uh, it's now been shortened. I think Lee, you, uh, you okay. had, you had related concerns on that. Okay. And then the final one I had, maybe you've taken care of this too, um, has to do with the provisions where it says the chapter shall become effective on July 1, 2020. And I wondered how that would apply to projects that were in the works. They've submitted their building permits before July 1, but they hadn't been approved until after July 1. How are you taking so that people don't end up at the end of the process with a whole new set of requirements? So thank you for your question, Chairperson Schifrin. So in the case <coughs> of a design permit being required, only it would be it would be July 1st the effective date so any planning engagement that predates the July 1st 2020 effective date the provisions of the prohibition would not apply to okay so that's for planning when there's a design permit now in the case of our city let me clarify that what are you what are you saying that if if i have an application in but i haven't gotten my uh, design permit yet I'm subject to it, but if no, I, no. So if I apply, if I've submitted my application before s July 1st and I, 2020, and I need a design permit, then I'm under the old rules. Correct. Okay. Now, as a further clarification, uh, we mentioned earlier in my response to Commissioner Nielsen's questions that it's it's the easiest for a design team to design all electric at the very outset. So, in the case of our city. There are some residential parcels that are neither uh, too narrow nor uh, too small, and the, the structure proposed on it is not too large in its conditioned floor area, and they are entitled to a ministerial permit application process applying directly for a building permit. So they would not have had the benefit of understanding the all-electric requirement during the planning very early stage of the project. So we propose, we in the current language of the ordinance, there's an additional 120 days if they're eligible and they're applying directly for a building permit. So that wouldn't be until November 1st. Okay. So, so it, I just wanted, when I read the ordinance, it didn't yes. seem like that those concerns were taken into consideration. <coughs> I thought they were, it sounds like they are. Okay. Um, everybody's had a chance to ask questions. Is there anybody in the public who would like to testify on this item? See? You. Not as a member of the public, but I do have a question. Oh, okay. If you want to close the public hearing. 
I'll close the public testimony <laughs> portion, bring it back to the commission and staff and ask the planning director what he has to say. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure we were addressing your question on uh, the restaurant because um, we did make some changes to the restaurant um, uh, criteria, but in, in I'm looking at the version we provided to the commission and then the um, the version that we have here in 6100.055A, if you scroll down to that, um, is the same here. Um, we made we made some changes in the definition that says, all right, a commercial kitchen is also exempt. Um, you know, so if if someone wanted to to cook in a commercial kitchen, it's not necessarily considered a restaurant. Um, so uh, we we made some changes there, but. Uh, Chair Schifrin, you uh, said that you had some concerns um, surrounding the restaurant, and I want to make sure that those uh, I, that we get a good understanding of those. I'm going to scroll back up to the definition. Fortunately, when I read it, it just sounded like uh, where it talks about revocable building and instruction infrastructure exemptions, the language seems to require the same kitchen design in restaurants that replace the originally designed. So yes. like once you have a design of your restaurant, that's a design you're stuck with um, and it can't really be changed. And it seemed to me, knowing how restaurants are, um, I can mm -hmm. think of examples and they can want to just really set up their whole setup. And I just didn't think it made any sense to prevent them from doing that. So. Did I misunderstand? So I believe I can answer your question, um, Chair Schifrin. So in the case that an exemption is extended when the structure is initially occupied as in a restaurant, that is the sole application is a new structure. In the subsequent period of time, the initial restaurant, the, the terms of their lease come to an end, and the new tenant is also a restaurant, and they deem it uh, prudent for their business to relocate the kitchen and alter the seating area. Well, it's it's not a newly constructed structure. The ordinance wouldn't apply. So the ordinance would not apply. So they, at their their design uh, professionals at will would be able to reconfigure the interior. Okay, thank you. I, yes. Just going down that path, since we're talking about it, what happens if the use ceases to exist for a certain amount of time and then? three years later, a restaurant wants to go into that same location and the gas was never removed from the building. I mean, can can that happen? Yes. Okay. So it's because the building was constructed with it and was allowed to have gas based on the use. Another use goes in for over six months because I know six months is a, is a, is a threshold within, within a cease of a use happening, right? Yes, but it, but that w that specific time frame wouldn't be applicable here. So, uh, in to give another example, a developer could build a mixed use building, put retail in on the ground floor, and not have any gas service going to it. A restaurant could move in at a later date, and because they're one of the exempted uses, they could then extend that gas line, even if one had never been extended. Okay. Now, if, if that restaurant moves out and um, a, another type of uh, use moves in that doesn't have an exemption, then they would no longer be able to, they would have to cap that gas line and not utilize it for you know, space heating or uh, anything else, even though the gas line is there. But at a later date, if a restaurant wanted to go back into the- It could reconnect. Okay, um, th okay so that brings up actually another question. Um, as a developer of a mixed use project, I mean, c can it, um, can, can a developer um, provide gas to a building with the assumption or with the thought that a restaurant would go in there at some point, but that may not happen right away? Is that gonna be allowed? That would be so long as, um, the, and it wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to connect Okay. Uh, until they've got those tenant improvements and they say, all right, this is connecting to a uh, range for a restaurant. Okay, so providing the gas line into the building is not the problem, but it connecting to it. The, it, the exemption is, the, the obsession is triggered on the basis of the design of the kitchen. So at the point at which the 
tenant improvement of the unimproved shell, say in the instance of the first, that would be the ins that would be what would trigger the exemption, and the gas line could be the service line could be installed into the into the building to the appliances. Okay. Well, after the after the building permit was issued, okay. understood. That yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I get it. I understand. Thank you. And to your point, I think uh, we'll make sure that it's clear because a a uh, a mixed use building may not have an end user when it's getting constructed and they may want to proactively install that gas line, which we wouldn't see as problematic as long as it's not connected um, unless there's a restaurant. We'll make sure that that's clear in the ordinance because I think um, uh, that was certainly the intent. <laughs> We want to make sure that yeah, it no, plays that makes, out that, that way. That makes sense. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the commission? We're really not being asked to take any official action on the proposal. I guess the recommendation was to provide comments. Um, I, I think it's clear by consensus that the commission is supportive of the overall approach. And you've... We did provide questions and comments, and hopefully they're useful to you. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's very informative. I've always felt bad that in my house I didn't have a, a gas range, but now I feel better about it. <laughs> I just wish uh, electric would heat up faster. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the comments. We have recorded them, and we'll follow up on them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to move to item number, uh, general business number three the discussion of Section 8 options for meeting the affordability requirements. I put this on the agenda um, because uh, the staff report is pretty self-explanatory, um, or the not the staff report, the agenda report. But I put it on because I'm concerned that when we uh, meet on the 19th to consider a specific ordinance uh, amendment, to incorporate Section 8, the, the potential of Section 8 in the um, in, um, amendment in the 20% inclusionary ordinance that we have, um, that we're able to do it at that night. We don't have to send it back. So I thought that there were a number of issues that it would be useful to talk about. I don't know. I guess the uh, economic development director couldn't make it tonight or isn't going to make it. Or maybe Representative, um, I don't know whether the subcommittee wants to say anything about the status of your work on the ordinance, um, but I, in my uh, report, I listed a number of questions, and I thought it might be useful to just sort of talk about, just talk about them and provide some input so that when you decide on your final recommendation, you'll have some sense of where the commission is. Sure. So let me first ask staff if you have any anything you'd like to say about this item, and then I'll ask Julie as the chair of the subcommittee if you have anything to say about this item. I'll ask the public if they have anything to say about it, and then we can just let, talk about the questions. Thanks, Chair Schifrin. I spoke with the Economic Development Director today. There was a, a meeting last night of the um, subcommittee, and um, the subcommittee's prepared to speak to their uh, current status and um, where they're at with this particular item. Great. Yeah. So go ahead, Julie. Sure. Um, so the subcommittee has, like, as, as uh, you know, Lee said, we uh, met last night. We met a number of times. There's been... Uh, quite a lot of discussion and involvement of other parties, um, including um, a pretty deep discussion with um, the city of Watsonville, uh, city staff. Uh, let's see, were you on that call? Um, I was on that call. I mean, so anyway, there have been a number of discussions. Um, I would appreciate your set of questions. They are very much conforming with the uh, kinds of questions that have been come up, coming up around the Section 8 issue. Um, and, you know, it, we we aren't ready to present, make a formal presentation. We're certainly not done with our work, um, including the, you know, the council directive to reach out and work with um, interested parties in the community. There's meetings set up and we're con con continuing to proceed with that. Um, a couple of your points, though, uh, that you listed in your questions, I thought might be worth 
uh, bringing out, and I guess actually I should just focusing on Section 8 right now rather than some of the other um, topics that the that our subcommittee is taking on. Um, and pardon my voice, I have a vocal cord injury, so it kind of bleeps out periodically, and I may need to punt to other committee members. Um, but the I think this is a good list of questions, and but we've been proceeding with the idea that we um, want to look at the having the ordinance amendment um, work, make sure that the 20% is um, uh, neither a uh, hindrance to the creation of housing, and also that it really allows for the kind of access to housing that we need. We know that lower income folks in the community really need. Um, so for instance, uh, we've had quite a lot of discussion around uh, the idea that uh, because of the, the rent standard, the payment standard paid by our local housing authority is really um, is quite high. We've gone to great lengths to make it so. Um, I appreciated the charts that you provided. Um, and so, you know, everyone can see that, that illustration. Um, that's been part of a multi-year effort to uh, improve access to housing by subsidy holders, not necessarily just Section 8, but other, other subsidies like, you know, HOME and uh, TBRA and uh, VASH and so, and so forth. Um, and there have been a number of other incentives that have been developed through the Landlord Incentive Program, which was really active for a number of years um, and still has existing programs that really branched off and, and, um, and existed, and still exist. Uh, but one of the issues that we found is that uh, in working so hard to provide incentives and reasons for landlords to accept um, subsidy. Um, one of the concerns is that uh, a landlord would only want to rent to subsidy holders, especially in properties that are quite marginal, where what the market would actually hearken uh, or, uh, for the unit might be quite a bit below the payment standard. Um, we've had a number of issues there where um, we've worked on over the years. Um, but we've also had, and this has came up through the city of Watsonville too, where they're finding that their landlords are only wanting to rent, some of their landlords, um, to voucher holders. Um, and I smiled a little bit because five years ago I would have thought that was a great success. Um, but at this point, what that means is that uh, if you don't have um, a voucher, which is highly unlikely if you are, well, the um, waiting list in our county has only been opened once in, you'd know exactly, something like 10 years. So it's um, it's really difficult to be on that list. It takes a long time. Um, and uh, many, many people who need access to rents that are lower aren't going to have the voucher. So. Um, even if it does result in a 40 or 50 percent AMI household um, overpaying by our definition of overpayment, um, they're still better off paying for uh, $1,400 um, for a one-bedroom apartment, say, than, um, or actually I think it's less than that, actually that is the targeted rent um, for a 60 percent AMI household. But that, uh, it, they're, even if they're overpaying, they still have access to housing that is more likely to be of decent quality. So um, I'm in a rather gassy way explaining that um, we have not landed on um, the policies that we think really work, um, and we're continuing to discuss them. Okay, thank that's you. Helpful. That's helpful. Let point. me ask the planning director, is it still, I, somebody showed me a, a, a legal ad that seemed to have say that there was going to be a, a hearing on an ordinance it seemed like I thought it was March 19th is that is that legal notice gone out that we're going to have a hearing on an ordinance at that date is that still happening we did notice that um, 
the it, it's my understanding right now that the subcommittee is still working on things and that that date that it'll be continued at that date that's the, that's the ex our um, expectation well I would personally really given the initial controversy around the 20 percent and the, the staff Position that having a Section 8 provision would really be helpful to developers trying to get financing. Um, I, my sense was that there was a desire to have this proceed expeditiously. Um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to go through some of this, so that some of these questions, so we could give some input, because there's no right answer, right? I mean, there's just, if you do this, there are some benefits, there are some disadvantages. If you do that, there are some benefits, there are some disadvantages. So, I mean, it's just, we do the best we can. If it helps, um, great. If there are some problems that come up, uh, but trying to find the, I, I hear what you're saying about, on the one hand, there are uh, lots of people who are low income who don't have vouchers. On the other hand, there are 500 people now with vouchers who can't find a place to live um, who are also low income. So the reality is the resources are totally inadequate no matter how you slice them, and the 20% inclusionary isn't going to solve that. It's just one is um, so what's a a reasonable way to go forward that one helps lower income families and two which was seemed to be a major concern of the staff what is it that helps developers uh, get financing because that was one of the major reasons for talking about the um, the, the, the Watsonville approach because my understanding was that um, market rate developers when they go to a, uh, a lender and say, I have to do 20% and I, I'll make them all Section 8, the lender's going to say, well, how do we know you're going to have enough people with vouchers? And um, they're not willing to base their pro formas on the payment standards. They're going to base it on what somebody who's a low income person is going to pay. And so if there was uh, a way that even temporarily, uh, a low-income unit could be rented at a payment standard rate or a fam or, or market rate, then that would assist in providing developers the financial ability to build their project. And um, I don't know um, you whether that was something that Bonnie was going to look into as she was going to talk to a lending institution yeah, to find we, out. We, we do. We have meetings set up uh, uh, coming up in the next week or or some other, or two, um, and we also have been pursuing some of the other questions around. Um, well, I guess that, that again, staying on the Section Eight topic. Um, so yeah, it, we are we are definitely, and I'm and I'm really glad to have your input on questions of concern. We've also had, um, you know, been touching on some of the operational questions uh, that about how does a program um, that you know is is really tying together um, a jurisdictional inclusionary ordinance, um, how does it interface with operationally with um, the housing authority because it's really different when it's when it's got a jurisdictional mandate in there and it's not strictly speaking um, the relationship between the developer and the housing authority which it usually is through the HAP payment the housing assistance payment contract um, and uh, so it, it that's also a worthy question and I know it's one that uh, we've struggled with with site-based uh, section 8 programs like the Nuevo Sol program, for instance, we've really wrestled with the timing between the housing authority, the property management, um, the owner, and in that case, there's also a service provider um, that has a role. Um, and you brought up some of those questions as well. What, what is the role, at least, of outreach to service providers? So, and I think that those are really good questions. Yes, Cindy, go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the work. Um, and I just wanted to um, add on to a little bit what Andy said. Um, you know, there's not a lot of, as you guys probably know, there's not a lot of long-term studies about how these things actually perform. 
but there are some studies, and uh, one of the things Excuse me, that, by that is, do you mean uh, inclusionary ordinances? Yes, or? I'm okay. sorry. Mm -hmm. In, how inclusionary ordinances perform based on um, the criteria of basically providing low income units and keeping them in that uh, affordability category. So one of the things that is consistent among those studies um, is is this idea of predictability for developers so that as they're planning their project and as Andy points out, financing their project, they have some predictability. And I think what what he spoke about um, would be kind of a new approach to thinking about um, using the housing payment standard um, and then crafting language that would allow for the temporary renting of that published housing standard or of that that payment standard and it would allow it essentially to convert to workforce housing if somebody doesn't have the subsidy a teacher or, or somebody with a service industry job would be able to rent that unit at that rate. It provides the predictability for the developer because they know when they go for the financing, they can say, hey, this is a one bedroom. The payment standard for Santa Cruz County now is 1844. If for some um, weird set of circumstances where they couldn't find a Section 8 person because there's plenty of them based on talking to service providers in our community, um, if they couldn't find a qualified Section 8 applicant, then they would know that they were still getting that rate. And again, that would keep that in, in our housing stock, it would keep that diversity in our housing stock and keep that consistent through time, consistent for the developer and consistent for the community as we're planning to look at our housing stock holistically. So I think it would be kind of an innovative approach. Um, but the more I read, the more I talk to folks, I think I think there's some strong, um, I, th I think there's some strong things in favor of, of an approach like that. So I hope that you all keep that on the table. And I think you mentioned um, uh, notification to service providers. Um, again, I think that that's a real key element because with that 30 day notice, it's such a short period of time. And if the people who are working with clients who have a voucher in hand for VASH or any of the other programs that have that Section 8 voucher in hand, if they're not getting notice, notice and it has to go through the housing authority, then it might have to go through the VA and then it might have to get to the actual social worker on the ground, that 30 days is long gone. And so I think there's a couple programs in the community, Housing Matters, um, the HUD VASH program, that could really get the word out and really help connect voucher holders with those units. So I think that would be something also that would be worth considering. Let me, um, Julie, were you, did you want to respond or? Uh, uh, we're taking your comments, happy to have them. I mean, did you want to make a point? Is it, is it the case that the 30-day uh, noticing period has been extended? Uh, well, of course, right now what we're just we're we're just we're looking at recommendations well, we're, we're and discussing them. But one of the points, yeah. But one of one of the points that we were trying to make is, and we've wrestled also, Cindy, with the point of what happens if to that you know the five percent that is eligible to, you know, meet their um, affordable housing participation requirement. Um, through renting to a Section 8 voucher holder, what happens in the event that they don't do it? Does it revert to market? Um, what happens then? Um, how long does that last? Um, or should it instead revert to something, uh, some rent limit that we might call uh, median income, which is pretty much we, what you were describing. Um, well, uh, another, uh, another issue on our to-do list is grappling with the definition of workforce housing. But for our purposes tonight, we could sure say that housing affordable to a median income household could qualify as workforce. Um, we're not proposing that definition because we're not ready to. Um, so we've wrestled with that. But another thing that we've, you know, you, there's the concern of, okay, they've got 30 days. You know, they, if they are by chance one of the property management firms with a no Section 8 um, policy, you know, tick tock, wait for the time to go by. Um, and we essentially don't want to reward them for running our clock. So we've talked about a couple different strategies. One of them is that they are required to allow 60 days um, to find a voucher holder, um, but uh, they can rent it. They can find one and appoint one 
um, at any time and much more quickly than if they wanted to, if they, they were one of the TikTok uh, housing providers uh, waiting for the clock to run out, um, that that it would be it, it, their very strong financial advantage to rent sooner and not leave a unit vacant. So we're deliberating on some of those types of things, and I think that's consistent with your point. Um, you know, I was thinking that we're yeah, going to have a uh, discussion, and I, I said that we we're just going to get a report. Why don't we see if yeah, anybody absolutely. in the audience would like to uh, testify? This would be your chance, and then we'll bring it back to the commission to talk about. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Um, this is a very complicated subject, and I'm not sure I can make too much more sense out of it to, uh, to help you this evening. But I would like to make a number of points. The first one is that, unfortunately, the council put the cart before the house. They raised it to 20 percent, uh, and it's not a horse. It's a whole team of horses that you have to look at because they said, okay, well, so we've raised it to 20%, now go out and figure out how to make it work. And this was just one of the ideas to make it work, which was to use the Watsonville 5% process to do that. Um, our position is, and we submitted our letter to you, that that alone is not going to make a developer build at 20%. It's not a significant enough uh, incentive for a developer. So a, a whole package is necessary and that kind of gets to your next <laughs> uh, item on your agenda, which is all the other things that should be looked at uh, all at the same time. So it's very complicated. If you change one item, then you're kind of messing with all the other items. Um, the only other thing I would like to bring up, and I may be absolutely wrong on this, but um, I think what's left out of the discussion this evening is the difference between a Section 8 voucher person and a person coming in with at the 80% low income. Uh, those are not necessarily the same people. Um, and because you raised it, because the city raised it to 20% in the process of doing that, they completely eliminated all of the programs that incentivize developers to build at lower income rates. So now the only thing a developer would likely build because it's at 80%, I mean at 20%, is at 80%. So at the, it doesn't go to the lower income levels. On the other hand, if 5% of those are Section 8 vouchers, those individuals, correct me if I'm wrong, may have much lower incomes than the other people. And I haven't heard that in the discussion, and that should be the most important thing uh, Obviously, incentivizing the developer is important, but there are a whole package of things that you can use to incentivize a developer. If you're going to use the Section 8, the focus should be on, does this actually help us get some lower income people into those houses? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let's bring it back, and I wonder if we could just maybe go through the questions and provide input at that with, with each of them. So the first um, question is, should the Section 8 option be voluntary or mandatory? What I'm hearing is that there seems to be a direction to move towards mandatory. Um, I would like, I think from my perspective, that has to do with incentives and whether in fact there's a financial incentive to have it be, uh, to have uh, the ability to have Section 8 vouchers. If there's a financial incentive, I'm not sure we even need to make it mandatory that developers are going to do it because it's going to make their projects feasible, which otherwise might not be possible. So I just <coughs> would ask that that be considered. Uh, Peter, why don't you go yeah. first then, Cindy? Yes, yeah, so some of the nuances we're getting into is so the current ordinance as it reads, you could do your full project at Section 8 housing uh, voucher uh, level, right? So we're really only talking about the 5% add, right? The, and whether we would make that some sort of mandatory use Section 8 or not, right? We're the difference is that we would allow, the, the major change is that we would allow the developer to not have to go 
rent to a low income person. They could use, they could rent to anybody at the fair market, at the housing payment level, mm -hmm. or at market rate. Those, those are the two alternatives right. on a temporary basis. And that theoretically would be now a developer, as you say, everybody could be Section 8, but if you go to the lending and entity, the entity is going to say, well, how do we know that? So it doesn't really help. Right. So the proposed change would allow, as it does mm -hmm. in Watsonville to an extent, to rent temporarily at a, at a market rate or a payment standard rate, and that would help with the financial feasibility. At least that's the theory. That's what would be different mm -hmm. than what exists. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think we're, we're headed in that direction already. Um, I think it's down to semantics, right? And one, one challenge is how do you write an ordinance that's easy to read and easy to manage, right? And it quickly gets into a lot of definitions and a lot of referencing to other areas. So there's a bit of a juggling act. And I, too, uh, am, am sensitive to getting something out there. But it seems to be it's a little bit more difficult than just getting something and hoping it's going to, you know, address something and be uh, fruitful at the end of the day. So I think it's got momentum, but it's not the 19th, unfortunately. I'm not ready to give up yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did, uh, I had a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is um, that when you know, one of the issues is is enforceability and monitoring, and as you just brought up, the, as it gets more and more complex, the performance um, of the analysis who that have been done, um, there's a, a negative correlation to that. So the more complicated, the more complicated set-asides and those kind of things, the actual production of of affordable units um, was not as anticipated in most cases that there are analyses for that, that I've looked at. So I think that's important to keep aside. I believe the council direction was to look at the Watsonville 5% um, set aside as a model. Um, so the question is, did it actually provide more affordable units? Because I had heard various uh, reports on how how many units have been actually produced, and then the other question is: um, Is there a way to write this ordinance that just gives a strong and primary preference to Section Eight and doesn't put a proportion pr proportionality to that? Um, is that a possibility? Question. We'll take that under consideration. Thanks. Could I ask if you've talked to individual developers? Uh, we have meetings scheduled. Um, yeah. So I met when I met with Bonnie, uh, local developer was there, and that's where I sort of got sort of hit with both sides mm -hmm. from him and from Bonnie that this would really make a big difference. That's kind of why I've been pushing on it because yeah. it seems like having that ability to get financing is a real major. Uh, be a real major help to a developer. So um, that's why, from my perspective, giving that option, having that option there, let them, if they want Section 8, they can do Section 8. If they don't, they don't. But if they do Section 8, then they have the ability, if they can't get a Section 8 voucher holder, to temporarily have it be market rate or at the payment standards. And then we come down to, okay, what's the enforcement mechanism? You talked about 60 days. One of the things that was talked about at the Housing Authority Board <coughs> was, okay, could the Housing Authority play a role, not in enforcing the law uh, or the ordinance, but in monitoring it and providing information to the City Economic Development Department as to um, if there was somebody who was just having the clock tick sending a report to say, okay, you get another 30 days or you get another 60 days because you haven't even interviewed any Section 8 tenants. Uh, and the, and, the, and the, if, if an owner does want to interview Section, does interview but rejects everybody who they see, uh, and the Housing Authority then is an agency that has the ability to uh, evaluate whether those rejections were reasonable, you know, 12 people in a one-bedroom apartment, or just they just didn't like uh, the way they uh, 
the question or addressed or whatever. Um, so I think there, there is a pro there could be a process that whereby um, developers would have to notify the housing authority, the, these yeah. other providers, uh, w when or even earlier, 50, 30 days before their unit is going to uh, be available, uh, to sort of kick off a period. They, the you know the various providers could notify the voucher holders to um, go meet with the with the owner. The owner then would be able to make a decision if the time period was up and they didn't have anybody and they wanted to go to either market or or um, <coughs> payment standards. They could you know contact the housing authority and explain why they couldn't why there was no voucher holder that they would accept. The voucher, the housing authority would then contact the city and say, no, okay, this is, we got to let this go, or this is somebody who just doesn't want to technically in it, and therefore just let's extend the, 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 the period. So, I, I mean, from my perspective, there is a, a approach that's workable, mm -hmm. that's um, not that complicated, and would allow for uh, low-income people, both voucher holder, oh, and leave it up to the developer. If the developer doesn't want to rent to a uh, Section 8 voucher holder, then tell the city that when you come in. I'll, I don't want any. I, I'll prefer to just rent to very low-income people and take the, take the loss. Or they'll come in and say, I'd like to have 5% or I'd like to have 10% of my Section 8 units, and then they're on the hook to rent to Section 8 voucher holders under the, the, city's, the city's program. So from my perspective, it's not all that complicated. Um, and I, I think that there are real, <clears throat> at least I've heard from one developer that this would really be assist, of assistance. If you hear from the bank that that would make a difference, I would really urge you to, you know, to get an ordinance together. I understand yeah, that sounds, attorneys it, have mm -hmm. looked at ordinances and Mm -hmm. Thank you. We and it sounds like we're on the same page. We are certainly concerned about how the banks will underwrite. Uh, we have some draft ordinance language; it is not ready. We have um, some additional vetting to do, um, but it sounds like we're concerned with uh, operationally with the various interested parties. We've been had multiple discussions with Jenny Panetta from the Housing Authority, um, certainly prospective developers, lenders and always, of course, service providers. Um, and, you know, that's a, that uh, is a network that it's really important to have closely mm. involved as well. So, yeah, thank you. Are there other, anybody else? Good list of add? questions. Um, yeah, yes. um, ahead, thank Mary. you. Thank you, Julie. Um, and it's been great, you know, working together on this. Better discussion. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on this difference between the, um, you know, going to market rate versus the payment standard and any kind of thoughts on we're, we're trying to figure out what you know the exit would be for developers who don't somehow find a voucher holder um, and we were talking about as, as was mentioned potentially like going to more of a, a moderate income or a workforce housing kind of level um, and trying to find you know comparisons there's we're now I think going to be in discussion with developers and lenders mm. about how, you know, predictable or not those other standards would be um, versus market rate. Um, in some cases, those levels at this point in time are actually higher than market rate, interestingly. Um, For new construction? Yeah, right. So we found, but that's just this, this moment in time. So moving forward, um, and depending on like what area median income, like how that's measured. Um, so, but I just don't know if any of you have any experience with this or thoughts on um, how, you know, that gets measured and decided. Well, I certainly have thoughts. Um, my initial thought was mm -hmm. that the best, the developers would want market rate. Yes. Because that's, the, that's normally, normally uh, especially for new construction, mm -hmm. that's, but that would, especially for new construction, probably put it out of the range of what our income, somebody who out of vouchers. Mm -hmm. um, so 
<clears throat> sort of getting moderate income that would be higher, right? Than eighty percent. So moderate hundred dollars. But from I've sort of gotten convinced that maybe since the, the thrust is have Section Eight voucher holders, and you're gonna, if you have Section Eight voucher holders, you're going to get owner, you're going to get the housing authority payment standards, and you're going to the bank is going to say, okay, with housing authority payment standards, we're you know we'll put that into the pro forma and we'll know whether you have a Section 8 voucher holder or not that you're going to get rent at the payment standard. And that's uh, like fair market rent. Is that the same exactly? Yeah, it's, the, no. the differential HUD puts out fair market rents. Yes. The housing authority sort of comes up with a through, payment standard. With it's a payment standard mm -hmm. that isn't supposed to exceed the fair market rent, but sometimes it can under, if it's within what's called a. Re it's like the most confused system you can imagine. But um, the, the housing authority, as you saw from the chart, has different payment standards across the county mm -hmm. based on whatever, okay. however they can figure it out in terms of what the income is. Well, but the steady. real question yeah. is, in ter from my mind, in terms of the Financing, what helps with the financing? Yeah. I've right. kind of gotten convinced that the benefit of using the payment standard, either with a Section 8 voucher or without a Section 8 voucher, is one, if it's okay with the Section 8 voucher in terms of financing, it's okay. Without the Section 8 voucher, mm -hmm. and two, for a lower income person, They're more likely to be able, even if they're if it's not restricted to low income, they're more likely to be able to afford the fair market rent even without a subsidy. With it. But so it still Andy, needs to I, be on a temporary basis. Is right. Yeah, and so I think that what you've just said is um, exactly what I said, or at least was trying to say in my opening comments. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is um, to give banks um, a steady number to which to underwrite. Uh, and we know that a tenant-based voucher cannot be used for underwriting purposes because it's not predictable, it's not site-based. Um, if instead we're offering a predictable limit, um, as, as I was trying to say, we're not saying it's market, which, what, but what we're saying is this is a defined number and you can underwrite to that number. So I think we're saying the same thing, which is great. Oh, you know, we're, um, you know, again, I think we're, we're still gathering input on it. And these, these are all of the questions that are in play, and we appreciate that you are seeing that, too. And did you have a point also? No. Oh, Cindy sorry. did want to say something. Yeah, misunderstood. I just wanted to kind of clarify on the record, and if anyone is watching, that the, the, the term fair market rate is kind of very confusing to people because when they hear fair market rate, they think what you have to pay if you go to Craigslist and what a two-bedroom costs. And so... Housing and Urban Development does a rental study, right? And then they develop what they think fair market rate is, and then the housing authority will take that and develop the payment standard for Section 8 vouchers, which is not entirely clear. So, so um, again, the idea of using that payment standard is it's exactly what you said, right? Mm -hmm. It's predictable. Um, it's fairly consistent, and that predictability is one of those things that that tends to come up in a lot of these readings and talking to people is something that's very important. And you do make a good point because the published FMR fair market rent that HUD publishes is always and it it's always off by a number of years, and in a market like ours, that can be really devastating. Yeah. And for that reason, in um, at different times. Um, but certainly recently we've made a concerted effort, the jurisdictions have worked with the Housing Authority to uh, undertake um, really specific and rigorous uh, studies of the actual rents, which is the reason why if you look, if you just Google FMR for Santa Cruz County, you'll come up with one number. But if you go to our Housing Authority's uh, website, you'll find what the actual reimbursement um, would be for a landlord um, in certain areas at this time. Yeah. And it, so it's worth noting that difference. Um, 
Could I cl try to clarify that a little bit? Because um, sure. it is really confusing. HUD traditionally annually puts out what a uh, fair market rent would be for one, two, three, four, five bedroom. It's been very low uh, for quite a while, way below what the actual market rent is if you go out and try to rent an apartment. Housing Authority has sponsored, with the help of the local jurisdictions, surveys to try to convince HUD that their fair market rents were uh, unreasonable and unrealistic. Over the last couple of years, they've been successful. The fair market rents have gone up very, very significantly, and they are much closer to um, what the actual market rents are. However, since the Housing Authority gets a budget of only so much money every year, and it has so many vouchers that it has to subsidize, and every family needs different level of subsidy, they have to sort of figure out, well, what's the maximum that we can normally pay in order to stay within our budget for the vouchers that we have? And that's where the payment standards come from. The payment standards are going to be less than the fair market rents, but not that much rent less. And the fair market rents that HUD comes out really drives the payment standards. The payment standards go through another couple of steps because they have to represent what's realistic in terms of the budget. Probably, that's probably, and then the, what's really weird is that on a case-by-case -case basis, not only can the housing authority agree to pay a landlord more than what's in the payment standard, they can, pay, they can agree under certain circumstances to pay more than what's in the fair market rent, as long as it's below something called a reasonable rent, <laughs> which is something that HUD releases a formula for what's the reasonable rent. So it's sort of like, it's very complicated. Uh, uh, it drives the housing authority staff crazy yeah. to try to figure it all out. But the, mm -hmm. the, it's all ultimately driven by HUD saying, this, these are the fair market rents, and this is how much money you're going to get housing authority, and so you figure out how much you're going to subs how much you're going to be able to subsidize and it's in that and so just like market rents aren't predict predictable from year to year as they respond to market conditions the fair market rents and the housing payment standards are going to change every year as well yeah they are i mean we're lucky over the last couple yeah. of years and it's gone up significantly and we've been in this period over the last couple of years where our market is really haywire and out of control but i know i've seen over um, the, the year as I've been in this field, um, there have been periods where um, in a fluctuating market, and we do have a fluctuating market, it doesn't feel like it right now because it's been pinched for so long, um, but we've had periods where even the FMR was higher than what landlords could garner, um, and um, which made Section 8 very attractive. Um, we've been ahead in a long period now where um, the market rents are so out of control that they're they're really hard to cope with. So, so yeah, I think we're all agreeing that um, we are trying to deal with uh, the vagaries of a market with the tools that we have. It seems like we're on the same page about what tools we have, um, and um, we look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you for your input. And you know, I hope the overall goals are one to you know, help make the projects feasible, mm -hmm. but also to serve the lower income communities. That's the underlying uh, rationale for the 20% is that more lower income people will be able to. Absolutely. So what I would like to request, uh, it's sounding like it's unrealistic to think that there's going to be a, a proposed ordinance on the 19th. That's right. I would like an agenda item. Um, that would be a report from the committee on the status of your and I think it's been advertised already, hasn't it, Lee? That's been advertised for the 19th, I think, which is why I really hope you could come up with a, even if it's a draft ordinance that we could take public input on and... I don't think that we will be doing that, but we'll do everything that we can, and we appreciate your input. Any further comments? All right, well, let's move on to the next item which is um, a discuss the work program for the ad hoc housing subcommittee and the desirability of establishing an ad hoc subcommittee on objective standards. 
And this, again, uh, is an item that I'm bringing uh, before the commission. And I was concerned at the sort of broad broadness of the Ad Hoc Housing Committee's um, work program and its lack of specificity. Uh, my understanding was the first issue was going to be the, you know, working on the 20% inclusionary you're doing and coming and trying to come up with uh, um, some kind of language around a Section 8 related amendment. But there are other potential ordinance amendments for the inclusionary. There are you know, workforce housing issues, housing type options. Uh, there was some discussion of density bonus. And I just thought the commission should have more of a discussion about what, in fact, sure. uh, the expectation is for the work of this subcommittee and the timeline and whether it would make sense to ask that we get a more detailed work program that the commission could prioritize. Yeah, so the, the council directed the commission to set up an ad hoc subcommittee and we have been working on, um, which, which happened, uh, we've been working on actually all of these items. Um, the workforce housing definition we've begun wrestling with. We've acknowledged and uh, discussed the fact that our inclusionary ordinance has been like a 40-year-old Christmas tree getting ornaments added and never seeming to get any taken off. I just made that up. That's pretty good. Huh? <laughs> um, I think at this point the needles are gone and it's nothing but uh, quite a few rusty ordinance. Some of them work um, and some of them really don't. Um, it's not going to be, at least I don't think, this isn't something the subcommittee or that we've landed on as staff. We've, we've looked at um, some of the pieces that make uh, this ordinance really clunky and difficult, both for, you know, for the community to understand, you know, what is it, or what are we accomplishing within it, certainly difficult for developers to understand, and it's even hard for staff to interpret. Um, so I think that there's some real problems. Um, and uh, beginning to look at that is, uh, uh, I think, an important, we were asked to, to discuss it. I do think that that's probably a bigger job. Um, I mean, I know it's a bigger job. There's, there will be a recommendation um, uh, coming out, but it's not, it's not ready to do that right now. Um, so some of the other things that uh, were brought up, and I appreciate that you included the staff report. Um, that that led to this we haven't gotten to talking about housing type options um, that's one that is um, one that I happen to have opinions about we have not had a chance to start talking about that I do think that um, it's it's been identified both by the council um, in staff reports as something that um, you know could and should get brought up and looked at um, and uh, I think this this commission at a meeting I wasn't at was also talking about are there things that we can do to uh, super energize the creation of ADUs that's kind of part of that same small units alternative housing types um, other discussions and then also um, the, you know very seriously whether there's things we want to do around implementation of the um, density bonus uh, and our local density bonus uh, ordinance um, and whether we'd be interested in doing what some other jurisdictions have done, including the county, um, uh, which has now even been superseded by the state. So it's in, any idea any jurisdiction has, it's kind of leapfrogged by the state in its de desperation to create opportunities and pathways for housing. Um, but um, that that is essentially the list of things that we're talking about. What I'm expecting is that um, on some some of these points, we'll we'll be coming back with um, some really clear recommendations. Like, for instance, um, a, a definition of workforce housing um, is something that I'm hoping that we can have within this city a working understanding of what we mean when we say that. Um, others such as um, what's the best pathway to undertake uh, some streamlining of our ordinance. I think what that'll be, not we're not going to be coming back with a rewritten ordinance, I'm sure of that, but I do think that it's an opportunity to um, 
uh, discuss it, take a look at options, uh, and come back again in response to the council direction um, uh, with some recommendations that then would be implemented through a work plan um, by staff because we don't write ordinances. Hey, uh, does anybody else on the committee want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I, I would uh, echo that. And I, I mean, there's other things I'd love to have on the subcommittee's agenda or that we discuss as a commission. Um, for instance, I'm interested in the whole question of um, community land trusts and the ability to take land off the speculative market and, mm -hmm. um, and the city's role in that. Um, I don't know that that's part of our agenda, um, but you know, so what happens when there are approaches to the creation of affordable housing that aren't on the agenda of the subcommittee? Do we then expand that agenda or do we bring it to the commission or, you know, how does that, how would that work if these four items don't, uh, you know, that there, there are possibilities beyond those um, that we want to address? So that's kind of a question that I have. Yeah, I would also just uh, say that uh, the final work plan is still a work in progress, right? We we kind of had two directions going into this. We had the, the creation of the subcommittee was on a slightly broader set of issues. And then we had subsequent to that, the very specific section eight issue to deal with, which we've spent most of the time focusing on. So we haven't really defined a work plan or whittle down to, you know, discernible pieces what the rest of the, the issues will actually have a chance to address in the near term. So I think that will be forthcoming. Um, that's on our agenda for the next meeting to finalize what that work plan actually is. So we'll, we'll have a little bit better understanding and I think can communicate more clearly what those issues are going to uh, be focusing on essentially. Question. Um, just to just to be very specific, um, just I'm going to list off some things about. I'm just curious if you guys are discussing these. Um, if not, maybe they maybe it'd be worth discussing. Um, sounded like you're already discussing density bonus, but enhanced density bonus as an option. Um, fee fee reductions. Is that something you guys are um, taking on? Um, fast track permitting, reduced parking requirements, unbundled parking, uh, reduced development standards, and ministerial approvals. Um, I think all in terms of um, ways to incentivize development. Um, uh, in terms of housing types, um, I think this falls under that, but small lot subdivisions um, would be an option. Um, I mean, I saw that in the, I remember in the, in the original report, um, subcommittee report, um, pretty sure there was things in terms of like dorm style housing, uh, lodging, um, detach, detached bedrooms. Um, that's interesting. I, I'm not even sure exactly what that is, but it'd be interesting for you guys to discuss that and <laughs> figure out how that works. Um, but co-housing um, certainly is um, something that I, I think is, uh, it's relevant um, to our community. Um, and then discussions around um, junior ADUs, um, you know, whether or not, you know, that junior ADUs can happen on mul with multifamily, because um, currently they cannot. Um, they do require on owner occupancy, so I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, but I guess that that's an option to remove that um, requirement. Um, and then also the ability to add, of adding more than one junior ADU to a property. Um, so, you know, those are all things that, that, that are on my mind um, that would be great to, for you guys to grapple with and discuss and, and come back to us with. 
Um, corridor plan, I'm assuming, is not any, anywhere close to your <laughs> to, to what not. you're dealing with, but I would love to see that come back, and I'd love to see some discussions on that. So I'll just leave it at that then. <laughs> well, my understanding is that that is coming back. Is it? Um, at the council direction. There is a discussion. We'll talk about it during the announcement section. But it's not our charge. Okay. That's my point. That'll be a whole other Yeah, but it is a good point. Like, how do we deal with questions of density and zoning in relation to multifamily housing within, you know, in this kind of like project by project basis without thinking about the court, you know, corridors? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because you, I, yeah, because that makes it. I mean, that's a good point because you have to look at it holistically and yeah. understand what the larger impacts are, mm -hmm. um, and you know, working within the, the constraints we we currently have and and how um, we can break free from some of those. And the corridor plan could easily be a place for that to happen. Yes, I agree. I, so I think this is a question to you. So um, I heard a lot of things, but I'm still unclear on the process of how we help uh, create a prioritized work plan yeah. because that's a real long list. And, yeah, I think well, that this was our opportunity to take input on that, and we, and we appreciate it. Well, okay. let me just say that I disagree with a number of the recommendations that have come out of it. I think the state law has provided so many opportunities for density bonuses, so many requirements for approving high density housing. I don't think the, or, and so many requirements in terms of ADUs. I am personally not in favor of doing anything more either with density bonuses mm -hmm. or in terms of providing, uh, you know, more ways to propose uh, housing on neighborhoods beyond what's already in state law. We don't even know what the effects of the recent changes in state law are going to be on us and uh, think that, gee, it's all wonderful. We should do even more when we don't even have any lived with uh, realities of what what the state has imposed, I think is definitely premature. Let me also say that my feeling is that if you're going to get if we're going to get anything done, we have to focus. And I think the example of the Section 8 in, on the inclusionary is a good example. One fairly small amendment to an ordinance and it's become very complicated. Lots of discussions, meeting with all sorts of people, um, even though it supposedly was going to be expedited through the process, now we can't even get it on the, probably can't even get it on the 19th agenda. Having, you know, 25 different things that the subcommittee is going to work on means that nothing, to me, it means nothing's ever going to get done. So I kind of agree with Cindy that we've got to prioritize and we need to focus. Mm -hmm. And some of these issues might best be done by a subcommittee, but I like to think that it's, I like that the subcommittee is focusing on the Section 8 issue. Um, they may well be focusing in on workforce housing, but my sense is as you start to try to do six or seven different things, nothing gets done. Everything gets delayed because you're talking about this, you're talking about that. So my, um, Desire, my expectation is that to the extent we're going to have this subcommittee, it makes sense to be real clear about what its priorities are, what are the particular things that it's going to be working on. So I, I'm appreciating that you're intending to come back with something specific, and then the commission can say, okay, yeah, uh, if a, a majority of us think that's what you should be working on, great. If the majority thinks that that should be a high priority, great. If other things are not such a high priority, then let's put them aside and just at least start to get things done in a, in a systematic way by focusing on one thing after another. So if I might, um, I uh, really appreciate that Christian brought up the really comprehensive list that came out of the housing blueprint, a long community process. Staff has put a lot of time in on it. The community has put a lot of time in, in on it. There's a lot of ideas there. Um, and the council uh, directed this commission to uh, set up this commission, this uh, subcommittee, um, really because, uh, uh, the, as I would put it, there was a very rushed change 
to an inclusionary ordinance that had not been vetted or thought through. And in setting up this sub -direct, this direction to set up the subcommittee really was to take the time to uh, do the vetting that is important. And I think that everyone has acknowledged the importance of having uh, uh, a policy that is going to allow developers and lenders uh, and the community to have an understanding of what's going to get built out of it. I think that there's really strong interest in, in fact, I've not heard anything from anybody myself that doesn't have an interest in trying to find a way to make a 20% um, inclusionary requirement work in this community. We have a huge need. However, um, the policy was adopted really without study or analysis. We still aren't doing economic analysis. Um, but what we are trying to do is um, take a look at it from a lot of perspectives. I can appreciate the sense of urgency, but I do think that it is important that at this time we take the time to be as thoughtful as we can and ensure its success. And that's what we're trying to do. I do understand the frustration that it's not faster. Um, and I, what I was trying to say earlier is we know we can't do everything that is in the housing blueprint. Um, and uh, those discussions continue. And we also obviously um, can't take on a lot of what our paid staff's work plan is. Our role here is to really be advisory to the council. Um, and we've taken on that charge. We're doing our best and we will proceed pace. I respond. Um, so um, I, thank you for that. Um, and I will and, and I will agree with with Chair Schifrin too in terms of um, focusing. And I think the I think really the focus here is about how do we get more housing? I mean, that's the focus, right? I mean, that's what everybody wants. That's what we're trying to get to. And, um, but there are a lot of different avenues and a lot of different things that, that have to be addressed and or have to be evaluated and looked at. It's, um, there's, there's so many different options um, for how to make that happen. But I do agree, there is a focus and that is the, the focus of, how do we get more housing? So uh -huh. um, I think that's what has to happen in that yeah. subcommittee. And I think that um, what I could say, maybe you guys want to jump in too. Um, we are really clear that um, what we were charged with uh, in when it was when this was set up is to take a look at um, workforce housing, um, look at this change that was quickly made to the inclusionary ordinance, try to make sure and you know, go through the process of discussing uh, it, and understanding the implications of it on some really key projects that we all want. You know, we all want the school to be able to provide teacher housing. It's a complex issue um, that I know I've worked on from a number of different perspectives. Um, so we know that housing is gonna be discussed in a lot of different places. What we're charged with is um, really fairly narrow. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about it more soon. Yeah, and I think it's a really um, just, I'm agreeing with everyone pretty much and that we do need to focus and figure out priorities and maybe there's some, and think about the different avenues towards producing more housing, more affordable housing. Um, and maybe there's ways of saying, okay, we focus on certain aspects that relate to incentivizing the private market to do, to do this. And, I think, um, Christian, you've brought up a number of approaches along those lines, and this is, I think, also what we're trying to do here. There may also be non-market approaches, um, such as community land trusts and, and so forth, that cities around the Bay Area are increasingly pursuing, um, and would be, I think would be great for our city also to engage with um, in giving, um, you know, when you see that there are multifamily developments, for instance, that are coming on the market, that tenants have the opportunity to purchase those those units, or the or community organizations have the opportunity to purchase those unit those units to preserve existing affordable housing. Um, so that might be another set. I think workforce housing and having employers involved in the you know as an avenue into the production of housing um, is perhaps a related but third approach. 
um, and that we kind of think about, you know, not just putting all of our eggs in these different baskets, but, you know, coming up with some rationale for how we're coming up with an agenda. You know, I think that those are really good points. And I think you know, part of the frustration, too, of the committee has been we want to talk about those issues and, and the impacts of finding ways to create the right type of housing in this community. And we're really trying to get just right this really specific thing. And that, that is our focus. And I think we're, we're close. We're really close. And I, I think we're going to have a better um, uh, submission or recommendation to the council because of it. And it's, I think, it, you know, this input is, um, for me, more a, a confirmation of, of where we've been headed. And we're, we're really talking about the same issues. So I think we're, we're really headed in the right direction. Well, my sense is if the committee is focusing on the amendment, that's great. I understand the issues of moving it forward quickly. Uh, and I understand that it is a priority and it's going to be, moved, you know, you're going to be moving as for, forward as quickly as you can. In terms of the other work programs of the, the other items to be covering uh, that, you, that the committee could be working on, both with the inclusionary ordinance and with other issues, um, I hope that the, the next kind of order of business is to come forward with a work program that sort of says, these are the things we want to work on. This is what we think should be the priorities and see whether, you know, have that discussion at the commission and see whether, you know, see what support the commission has for those directions. So, and I hope that that, you know, I'm looking forward to that coming soon because I think it's not like these aren't important issues. It's just that, um, you know, I just, I've, it, it, I myself was very frustrated with the blueprint process because it was a long process. Lots of people were involved. It went on for a long time. And all that we ended up with was a huge list yeah. of things that could be done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting from that huge list to mm -hmm. doing something, and as a strong advocate for going to 20%, it was doing something that will help with affordable housing. And I don't have a problem with now let's make it work. Um, that's how things were done. That's how the first inclusionary ordinance was passed when it was 15%. It was like everybody said it wouldn't work. We did it. We didn't do studies, and the developers and the, and the community figured out a way to make it work. I think that's what we need to do here. And from my perspective, the Section 8, what we're calling the Section 8 Amendment, is a, is a first attempt to make that happen. And I think other... Uh, revisions to the ordinance that simplify it, maybe streamline it. Uh, I've also looked at the ordinance, and it's, it is old, and it does have a lot of clunkers in it that don't really need to be there anymore that are relevant. So I think there are going to be ways <coughs> to simplify it and make it more straightforward, um, but still keep the, the essential thrust, which is providing additional. So the other um, issue that I brought up, but I, maybe I want to give a chance for a member of the pub, members of the public to speak if you want to speak on this item. Uh, thank you. Uh, just very quickly, we, we recognize, as we said before, how complicated this is and how many different items there are that could be looked at and should be looked at. And there are some in our letter that weren't brought up uh, that we hope that you would look at. Um, but I, I think the reality is that raising it to 20%, at this point, there are not going to be developers lining up to build. So I don't think there has, this, there has to be a rush to get this done. I think it should be done right, and the whole picture should be looked at because our, our current codes and, and ordinances for, how, I mean, as you said, I mean, just read them. Try to read them. They're, they're very complicated. There's years of layers of things that in many cases were sort of meant to slow things down rather than to speed them up. So this would take some time. It takes a lot of staff time to do this. So I don't, I don't see the rush for that. I think it should, it's better that it be done right than it be done quickly because, as I said, I don't think developers are going to be lining up to build um, until they know what might be out there. Um, the second thing I wanted to bring up was I, 
um, <laughs> just to add to the list, you might remember that the workforce housing came up, correct me if I'm wrong, it came up because the school district people were concerned that raising it to 20% would kill their project. Um, so the workforce, is that correct? Yeah, so the workforce housing part is important. It's also important because Prop 13 looks like that's gonna pass. And Prop 13 has both money for school districts to build more housing, also the UCSC. And as I put in the letter, it also um, creates the incentive for developers to do it and not have to pay school dedication fees. So because the state has moved already, there's one other issue <laughs> to catch up with with the state uh, <clears throat> for workforce housing. So yep, it's all of the above and <laughs> good luck. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, if I could just quickly respond, I think that's, um, and thank you um, for that comment. I think that's one of the reasons why workforce housing is our next agenda item is because we're very cognizant of the fact that we, we don't want to impede in any way the school district from moving forward on their plans, which are not imminent, but are coming soon. Yeah, so we're trying to get that done in a timely manner. The second issue was having, that I brought up on this item was an, uh, whether it made sense to set up a subcommittee on objective standards. And this, um, if we think that our ordinances are complicated and difficult to read, uh, lots of luck with state law. And the state trying to figure out just what the state law is requiring is really um, difficult. But there definitely seems to be a movement towards ministerial um, decisions, uh, requirements that local governments approve projects um, that meet the general plan and the zoning, and objective standards. And so the whole notion of what's an objective standard and what's a subjective standard uh, has become sort of a term of art of importance. And um, as the commissioners may probably know, the city has gotten a grant from the state or approval for a grant uh, and is waiting for the money to come, unless it's come in the last week or so, and is intending to hire a consultant to work with staff and um, to come up with a set of objective standards that could then be placed in the ordinance and be relevant to evaluating development projects. So since the, a major role of the commission is to evaluate development projects, it seemed important to me to uh, discuss what the role of the commission was going to be in terms of the development of these objective standards. Um, we have two architects on the commission with a lot of experience with development, um, and you know we are, we are in the role of trying to evaluate developments when they come forward. And what we have before us is the ordinance that says, well, what are the performance standards? What are the requirements? So I met with the planning director to talk about potential uh, commission roles. Um, if I could, you can correct me if I got uh, conversation wrong, but. My understanding was the director would, uh, was thinking about having a technical advisory committee that put, may have commission members on it with other staff from other departments. I was kind of favoring the notion of having a subcommittee of the commission that was just tasked, an ad hoc subcommittee that was tasked to work with the staff and the consultant on this. So um, I wanted to have us talk about it. Uh, get back from commissioners, have the planning director give his point of view to us, to everybody, not just me, and then see if, you know, what, whether there's a desire for the commission to do anything. Sure. So, a um, couple of things. One, uh, we haven't released an RFP yet. Um, so, a request for proposals will be going out. We are, we are guaranteed the money. We're actually considering releasing the RFP in advance of actually getting the money because we won't be paying that for some time. Um, by the time we get someone on contract, we've been, um, you know, waiting for that money. But we've been waiting for three months now, um, so we keep hearing it'll be happening really soon. And what um, what I expect when we get those responses back, and this is where I just want to clarify. Um, uh, what I think the Planning Commission's role will be in this. 
uh, what I expect when we get those back is that many, if not all, of them have some type of technical advisory committee. And being that this is a uh, issue that comes before the Planning Commission, um, part of that technical advisory committee will be made up of planning commissioners. And uh, we'd be relying on uh, the expertise that you all bring to help guide and shape that technical advisory committee. Um, what it, now, now that isn't guaranteed how that works. It could be that there is a larger community advisory committee and rather than having a separate technical advisory committee, the um, planning commission members uh, participate as part of that community advisory committee. It could be both of those things. There could be a technical advisory committee and a community advisory committee. I think the, the important thing that we want to do when we release this RFP is actually not specify the planning commission's role. And the reason why I think that's important is because when we get RFP responses back, we want to have the creative ideas of those um, respondents, of those consultants, not be bound by something saying, you will do it this way. Oftentimes what can happen with the RFP responses is we have a consultant team that we think is great and they're the best ones. And we say, you know what though, like there was this really great idea. Um, for community outreach or for planning commission involvement. And what do you think about including that? And if we specify in the RFP that this is what uh, commission's role is gonna be in there, then there's a potential to stymie that creativity in those responses. And so I'm very reluctant to specify exactly what the planning commission's role is gonna be as part of that RFP in favor of, of hearing what um, creative ideas could come back. Um, most, that said, most RFPs that go out come back with a technical advisory committee and or a community advisory committee. So I would expect that. Um, and maybe we get something else. Maybe that's all we've got. Um, but as we um, move forward with the uh, release of the RFP, the responses will um, certainly be keeping the Planning Commission abreast of the direction that we're heading. And, and we do anticipate that the Planning Commission has a role to play in that beyond just um, you know, bringing it to the Planning Commission um, when, it's, uh, when it's ready for um, formal uh, recommendation. Um, I would expect there are gonna be some, uh, a, a variety of check-in points throughout the process where um, there is involvement of the Planning Commission as a whole, as well as with um, some other subcommittee, is, um, however those may uh, play out once we hear from the consultants. Yeah, I'm just wondering um, to go back to the community involvement piece and how much we specify in the RFP. Um, given that this is going to be a big change for the community, um, I, I think that it is in all of our best interest to, um, we can leave it uh, perhaps open about the mechanism in which they're involved, but I think it would be very important to specify in that RFP that there would be a robust community involvement component of to, to these standards and that we actually call that out. Um, because I think from start to finish, the more transparent we can make this for the community, I think the more um, likely we are to get support as we move forward with this mandate. Without a doubt, yeah, we already have that draft and that is a significant component, including a list of, uh, I'm not gonna try to count the number, but if you look at uh, the recent um, second meeting in February, I believe it was, uh, actually, excuse me, second meeting in January for the council, we actually um, had a list of potentially affected interests and it was a list, of, it was just a brainstorming, initial brainstorming, but it's just, uh, that I think um, provides emphasis for the RFP respondents to understand how many different groups and how many different stakeholders we're actually um, expecting that they attempt to engage. We can't guarantee that, you know, if they say, all right, we want to get a, a lot of renters and we want to get young people and we want to get students and we want to get homeowners. You know, we can't guarantee that all those folks will participate, but there needs to be a very active effort to engage as broad a spectrum of the community as is willing to talk with us. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm, on the yeah. other hand, we'd like to um, have objective standards within our lifetime. And so um, 
having a process that goes on for three and a half years serve the city very well. So, did you want to say something, Julie? Uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I, because we, I spent a lot of time talking about objective standards. I'm on the committee for um, the county is developing it. It's a really complex process, and um, I'm really looking forward to the responses to the RFP that are being put out. And I do think that it's important for the community to have an opportunity to weigh in on, um, and, and even just to understand um, the extent to which uh, the city has latitude and does not have latitude um, in terms of what we're creating um, with objective standards and what it means um, going forward for the projects that are developed. So I think it's really important. Um, I um, don't believe that there should be a subcommittee of the Planning Commission for Objective Standards set up at this point. Um, I personally think a TAC um, with a prescribed community involvement is um, a, a better approach. Um, well, I feel that pretty strongly, um, and it's too soon at any rate. Um, so I think, you know, thank you for bringing it up, and it's, um, there's, there's a lot going on. I mean, I'm curious about um, how the planning department is managing its work plan. I, I think you've been breaking it off in like six-month chunks um, instead of annual chunks. So um, I'm interested in how it works in with all that because there's a lot going on. There is a lot going on, um, and um, to Chair Schifrin's point, you know that's a point well taken as well. You know we want to move these forward as quickly as possible because as developments move forward, we want to be able to ensure that we get what's best for the community in terms of the quality of design, the quality of architecture, and we have limited ability to do that under the current state regulations that um, prescribe how we cannot reduce the density of projects below what is below what is allowed by the general plan um, and our ability to use subjective standards um, is is limited by that we can't we can't deny projects based on subjective standards nor can we reduce the development capacity based on subjective standards and uh, nor can we use objective standards to uh, reduce the development capacity what's allowed uh, below what's allowed by the general plan. Um, I'd like to um, just let the commission know, sort of, you know, we don't have a date yet, but just advance notice and we'll certainly be reaching out to you all that um, we will be doing a study session with the council in the coming months, um, probably in the late May or perhaps the June timeframe that speaks to a lot of the um, the state laws that have been passed recently um, with the dual focus, um, one on um, just the housing um, uh, laws in general. So um, AB 1760 or SB 1763 um, from uh, January 1st of um, last year, or excuse me, yeah, of 2019, um, SB 330, which uh, took effect January 1st of this year, um, and um, various others, uh, including uh, the second part of that is the focus on um, uh, rent control and uh, tenant protections, so that um, it's also informative for not only the council and the planning commission, but also the community um, to really understand, hear the new rules that we're playing by. Great that you're doing that. So let me say that behind objective standards are values. And people have different values. And I think members of the commission, just like members of the council, have different values. And my suggestion is I'm not always in agreement with the staff's values, as the staff knows. Uh, and I don't think, that, I, I think that given that the objective standards are uh, going to play a, a critical role in what the city had the ability of the city to really regulate development um, it just seems very important for different points of view to be part of that process so um, I'm not convinced that it doesn't I don't see this as simply a technical exercise 
I think it is also a political exercise and a value-based exercise. And while I think it's important to have community input, ultimately it's going to come down to four votes on the four or more votes on the city council, um, and it's going to come down to a vote at the planning commission. And I just think it's important, given that reality, that the planning commission play a very active role in that process and not have it be staff dominated, whether it's tax staff or consultant dominated, where they come with their own set of values and points of view. So um, I'd like to get, ask you to report back at subsequent meetings on the status of the RFP. Um, I feel uh, I can accept waiting to see what they come up with, but ultimately the consultant will work for the city and the council will approve their project, and if the commission majority wants to recommend that uh, a subcommittee be uh, set up of the commission to work with the consultant, that's a recommendation that this commission can make, and uh, the council can either do it or not do it, but I think um, there, there are different points of view as to how this process should uh, proceed, and Unfortunately, we're still waiting to get the ability to, for it to proceed, but I'm just, I'm not prepared to just say, okay, let the technical people run the whole process and have a bunch of community meetings so that they can say that there's community input. Okay. So no action is required on this. Um, any, any more discussion on this item that anybody would like to have? So we have no public hearings. We have no information items. Any? I have some. I have you some have information. Any information yes. Well, uh, right, <laughs> I just wanted to um, give the commission a heads up on a couple of things. Um, one, at the next meeting, the March nineteenth, the council's uh, January twenty eighth discussion referred um, uh, potential options for moving forward with zoning and general plan reconciliation. Um, you know, that is related to the corridors. And uh, so there'll be a discussion about that at the next meeting on March 19th. And then at March 24th uh, at the council meeting, there'll be an update on last year's progress towards meeting the regional housing needs allocation, the RENA targets. And then that'll subsequently be forwarded to the planning commission as an informational item in um, April. So there's no way for the commission to see it in advance? There's not, um, uh, I mean, um, we are still working on those numbers right now, and so um, we'll be we'll be getting that um, ready just in time for the um, the March twenty fourth council meeting. But uh, you know we're we're happy to refer that, and that's what we'll be indicating as part of our agenda report as well. Um, that you know that information will get forwarded over to you in advance uh, or uh, following the council meeting. Okay, any other information items from anybody? Any subcommittee? We've sort of had subcommittee advisory body oral reports. Uh, something going on with uh, ad the Westcliff adaptation um, study. I think there's going to be some public uh, meetings that are coming up. Consultants should be releasing their evaluation of the initial cut of alternatives uh, sometime this month. There's an outreach meeting today, and there'll be a Spanish um, outreach meeting on uh, Saturday. And yes, the, the next deliverable from the consultants is due in the next uh, couple of weeks here. Anybody want to refer an item to a future agenda? Seeing none, we're adjourned. One. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I just was talking about calendar. I know, for example, spring break is coming up early April. Do we have a, what is our first meeting that month? Give me just a moment. I can no I can look and see. Just looking at that. Thanks for bringing that up. And let you know if we have anything scheduled. Yeah. Uh, no, the second. second. No, no, no. April second. No, no, no. April second. April second. First and oh, third Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. So as it currently stands, I won't. I will be out of town on the second. And I'll be out of town on the 16th.
Okay, are we, did we decide we are I, meeting I may be out of town now? on the second as well. Okay. Maybe two of us would be gone. On the, on the second, yeah. Thanks for those early heads up. Yeah. Uh, if we I can confirm that, I'm, okay. Mm -hmm. If we've got items planned, we'll uh, send out information to confirm we have a quorum. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other business? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.